And we are live. So, ladies and gentlemen, we have a very special guest here on Growing Fruition Podcast. This is the man, the myth, the legend himself, Nathan Reynolds. And he has a story, a testimony, knowledge that can outnumber any amount of library books you can even conceive to read. And he is a huge hope in our faith. And I am so glad to have him and soak up all of the things that he knows. You guys are going to walk away from this video, this podcast. It's worth the investment. If you've got a little bit of time to sit down and watch, you're going to learn things that you never knew existed. You're going to learn things that are going to boost your faith. You guys are going to learn things about yourself. You're going to learn things about the world that you live in, and it's going to totally blow your mind. So please give a warm welcome and thank you, Nathan, for coming on board. Tyler, I couldn't be more fired up to be here. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here. And for those of you that are checking in with us tonight, you know, it has been an absolutely incredible journey over the last 34 years of my life. But I have to say the place that I'm sitting in today, it could not be more contrasting to where it all began for me. And I, I'm just humbled that there are honest, righteous people who are seeking to bring to light what has been a eon decades of of darkness that have been shed over people veils that have been pulled over people's eyes to keep them in this spiritual and physical slumber so that the adversaries of truth could just devour people and i was raised in a family that was just inexplicably linked to darkness that had embraced the path of power and control games and they found that the best way to do that was through exploitation of people as if they were a human resource bank and you kind of get this corporatization of the economy of souls. You know, this is like there's this like scripture verse at the very end of time. It talks about that there's Babylon, right? This great empire, this dynastic kingdom that they have all these merchants that are just we're all these corporations that are running everything. And it talks about one of the things they're trafficking in is the souls of men. And I was born into a family that has been for generations trafficking in the souls of men, the soul of the man, the soul of of women, mankind is your mind, your will, your emotions, your intellect, your cognitive choices, the things that pass through your brain. It's like if anybody could just understand at the very baseline of it, not every thought you think is your own. Some of those have been supplanted in you from the world. There is a spiritual realm out here that just is passing information. We're like walking around with spiritual antennas that are picking up information. And then it's like our flesh. It's like the person that's just kind of inside us, the self narrator. But I was raised in a society and in a culture that, that captivated people that captured the imaginations and locked them into an idea of a culture or a, a conspiracy of silence. And it took me decades to really break out of the mindset of what I was raised in. I didn't even understand I was being raised in something that was so evil, that was so strategically seductive until I literally was married with my wife and we were years into our marriage. And I finally started hearing stories of what her childhood were like. And I would sit there and tell her stories about what my childhood was like. And she'd have these eyes just getting bigger and bigger being like, that is super perverse, honey. That is not right. And I'm like, what do you mean? You know, it took it took a literal mental undoing of this serious cognitive dissonance, this programming that had been ensconced into me as to what I accepted as normal, what I accepted as OK. And I grew up in an area in Arizona and in a culture where children were passed through these fires of abuse. And I was raised by a family that on one side looked very Christian, that had a sincere faith, my direct family, my father, my mother, my sisters. But then on the other side of it, our extended family were open embracers of a totally different ideology, an ideology that was this old religion, and it predominantly predated upon children. And the way that they did that is they would hand me off. They would, they would give me over kind of almost like custody rights to my grandfather in Lake Havasu City, Arizona, and he was a, a fourth order Knights of Columbus. Knights of Columbus is a, is a fraternal organization. It's like the largest fraternal organization. People would call it a secret society, right? Meaning you can't just go sign up and walk in those doors, y'all. You got to swear a serious oath, and in order to be a part of it, you got to be a man, right? And I had no idea the level of depravity that was in store for me at those early stages of my life, but but he was a systemic exploiter of children, and the way that he did that was to physically abuse them, sexually abuse them, psychologically abuse them, and shatter their self-will, shatter their identity, shatter their hope. It's, it's what something is called disintegration, and uh, this was in, at the time being pursued very heavily in order to create something. It's like a mind-controlled slave, you know, and somebody that was willing to keep the secrets of the family and was willing to go along with these agendas of 
corrupting people, of, of being used for exploitation of people that may be in a position of power to, to let my body be the currency that was passed around a community of perverts. And that's what Lake Havasu City was really built up. It was founded in order to facilitate this. The city of, of Lake Havasu was built by a man who, Robert McCulloch, who decided he wanted a, a play place, a pleasure island out in the deserts of, of Arizona on the boundary with California and Arizona. And so he brought the London Bridge, which was used in the, over the Thames River in the city of London in, uh, or in Great Britain. And that building, that, that physical structure had been used for over a century and a half. And this is where everyone gets this child's rhyme of the London Bridge is falling down, is falling down. The reason they used to sing that song is because they used to offer human sacrifices and put children inside the walls of that structure in order to hold up the empire. It's the ultimate power and control that a governing body has over its people is if they can convince them to voluntarily give their children over to a system of total destruction. And once they have that, they physically feed off of the, the control. They create a, a, a mass of people who are so committed to the cause that they're willing to give over what should be their most precious treasure, their most precious resource. And you'll see so many parallels to that same en social engineering that is to modernity, to today, that, that, that has never stopped, that, is, that has been going on since the time began, that you have some people that want to hold on to power and they're not willing to let go of it for any reason. And so I grew up in this culture of, of corruption and seeing radical intelligent evil put on human suits and perform the worst acts of violence and depravity to children and to family members, to people I loved. And so I, I learned this helplessness, that there was nothing I could do to get out of it. And once my will was broken, I became willing to just do whatever I was told to be completely obedient to that system. And I had this predilection towards um, learning and retaining information. And so they kind of made me a secret keeper that I was entrusted with all kinds of information that then I would regurgitate and pass back to them and, and made to be like a mule of, of child pornography of, of physical currency of evidence on, on people. They call it little black books. And this is what's used in the, in the behind the scenes world of, of echelons of power Blackmail is the currency. It's it's people's secrets. It's the skeletons in their closets that really determines how they're going to be utilized by the network or the family abroad. And so I was trapped in this world for many years of my life, and I had a, a deep-seated desire to break out and to make it stop. And so I got cultivated and groomed to be a part of, of assassination programs and started trying to go and fight back against these people. And, and I learned through the Jesuits a way of of hunting people down, of killing people. And this is what they've been known for for time and modernity, the assassins, like the assassins. And so I got caught up in a culture of, of murder and of bloodshed of, and of violence. And it was like the only time I ever got out, the only time I ever got to really express my gifts. But otherwise, in my normal, my normal life, I was anonymous. I was background noise. I was never allowed to have the uh, intellect. I was never allowed to show off any aspects of exceptionalism. My family lived in this uh, background noise culture that anytime that I started getting noticed, anytime abuse was noticed, we would move. I would change schools. My family would pull me out and, and transfer me. We would move constantly. And so it created in me this never ending like realization that I can never have love. I can never be attached to anyone because to have that connection meant meant loss. Every time I connected with somebody, I was gone. I was, I was ripped away from him. And it just created a culture for me of instability. And so this went on for many years of my life until when I was a junior in high school, I got emancipated to the United States military and began to, to be a part of what's called special kill teams, where I was used as uh, what they would call in the open man's language, uh, strategic eliminations, right? People think that the United States government only kills people overseas, like American citizens with drone strikes. But these surgical strikes are often done by People here in the United States, sleeper cells, uh, operatives who work in clandestine fields under State Department and under um, basically what you, people would think of as like an ambassador. The United States ambassadors or other countries, foreign diplomats, they have diplomatic immunity. And so this allows them to commit incredible crimes in the United States and get away with it. And so there's a lot of black operations projects that take place under the charters of State Department run facilities. And so I got caught up with what I thought was going to be my way out, what I thought was going to be my freedom, which was to be a hero. Like I'm, I was raised in the same culture as everybody else, that, that the two most manly men that if you really want to be a man, if you want to really like make a difference, you basically can go be a, a man in sports. And you can go be like a hero in the sports field or you can do it in the United States military, maybe in like the emergency medical response with police and firefighters. But basically, there's no men anywhere else that's ever publicized. They don't they don't show you authentic farmers. They don't show you ranchers. They don't show you like men who work and labor and toil and uh, inside the earth as miners. And they don't show you and make it uh, desirable. They show you a sissified culture. 
for all intents and purposes, except for in a few venues where they're like, yeah, if you want to go be a man, you can go that way. And so I thought I bought it hook, line and seeker. And I thought my, the rest of my life was going to be devoted to working my way in the United States military and being a part of tier one operations. I thought finally I would be able to, to hunt down these people. And, and I got to do that for a few, for a few years. But ultimately I started seeing that the same corruption that I saw in my family, that they could, they could just tell me and convince me that somebody was a criminal, that somebody was a pedophile. I would go after them and I would hunt them and devour them. And I started seeing behind the scenes and, and picking up other pieces of information that was showing me that I was, I was nothing more than a hitman for hire for people that had their own agendas, just like what happened in the families, just like what happened in the brotherhoods that even in the United States military, it was the, it was the largest trafficking or organization in the world. There's more human material, drugs, narcotics, and human trafficking taking place in the United States military through the United States military's infrastructure, the bases that we have all over, all over the world. There was more taking place through that than I ever saw in the Catholic church. And it just, it was like the death of my idol, Tyler. I, I'd lo I, I lost myself in there because I thought my whole life that was, the, that was the solution. I could finally go be with the real warriors. And I found real corruption and I found compromise. And as soon as I find compromise, man, I am like a wolf seeking to tear the throat out of the ones who are instituting it. I can't stand it when I see somebody who's capitulated to keep the secrets to go after the, the greediness for gain, the love of money, the root of all kinds of evil. And so I got quickly escorted out of the United States military. I got an honorable medical discharge and I launched into the field of psychology, trying to piece back together what was stolen from me, my innocence, my mind, my intellect. I wanted to be healed. I wanted to help other people heal. And so it led me onto a path of restoration and it led me onto a path where I ran back to these scriptures, where I ran back to this identity that I had lost and began to try to put myself together again, you know, because I was just this fractured, broken soul who wanted to be wanted to be normal. I wanted to experience love and intimacy and relationships separate from bloodshed. And so this is ultimately where I ended up meeting my wife, the woman who became my wife. And I share about a lot of this in my book, Snatched from the Flames, and meeting this woman who started to begin to unravel for me a lifetime of systemic book. That's my book right there. Yes, sir. And uh, she showed me authentic love and she showed me commitment. She showed me something called covenant where there was not... Um, an ulterior motive. She was the first person I truly experienced unconditional love from that didn't have an ulterior agenda. And it, and it, it did something to me. It, it still does something to me because she's still here. I'm, I'm 12 years into my marriage with her and y'all, I kept a lot of secrets from her going into that. I, she didn't know who I was when she married me. She didn't know who the wolves were in my family. She'd had no idea what she was getting into. I, I had been physically like, marked and maimed and castrated so that I couldn't have children when I was in that brotherhood because they'd put me in with king's daughters and princesses daughters. I was, I was a bodyguard to their harems at times and they don't want any bastard children for lack of a better word being raised up. And so when we got married, I didn't think children were going to be a reality for us, but then the father did a miracle and I believe he can do that with anybody. And he gave me a child through my wife and I, and he opened her womb and I was left with this decision of, do I make my daughter pass through these same fires so we can have access to the trust fund? Cause it's a legal guardian trust fund and you have to give legal guardianship of your child over to these people so that you can then have the compromise. They have the blackmail on you, but then you get access to the trust fund. Then you get access to the estates in the phone book. But I wasn't willing to do that. I wanted for my daughter, Naomi, I wanted her to get to choose her life. I wanted her to know freedom in areas that I never did. And this is what set the stage for an, an ultimate showdown of war, absolute, complete, bare knuckle drag out warfare that unleashed itself on my family, on Chelsea and I, and people trying to hunt us down and kill us because I wouldn't capitulate. I wouldn't compromise. And I began to speak the secrets and come out and try to seek the, the freedom to all those who are in bondage. And that's what's led me on this journey where I am today. That is honestly where exactly I want to leave off of because something that I'm dealing with in my life right now, and I think that are questions on a lot of people that are really diving into the word and kind of escaping out of the big church type of faith and um, really becoming a, alive and awakened in the remnant, mm -hmm. in that closeness, in that just whole different playing field of faith. And 
one of those things is especially gleaning from your situation what are some tips to becoming the most effective spiritual warrior in the kingdom of heaven and mm. faced in circumstances where perceivably it's imminent death yeah you're either going to have a fight or flight reflex response and use your flesh to divert a situation and unfavorable outcomes or you're going to be completely disciplined and rely on your spirit man to mm. call upon the powers that can toss mountains into oceans and leave it up to his will to either deliver you as his child. That's right. And you have gone through this and I want to hear directly from you how it is looking back in hindsight on the things that you've went through and also the knowledge that you have now, how, how would you best be a warrior both fleshly and spiritually in those circumstances? Every time I think about who are warriors and how do you become a warrior, like what got me out of this, y'all, was the the word. Okay, the, we we think these stories that that these like accurate the, the the scriptures is like a reliable historical text that I've tested. It's not just some kind of book that I picked up one day and was like this this man on the stage here says I can trust it, you know, and because he says I can trust it, I can trust it, or because the Bible says it can be trusted, the Bible is what I believe. Like I tested this thing. Like I've, I've put it to the test. I, I don't test the father directly, but at the same time, my whole life has been nothing but a perpetual, like hanging on by a thread. Like the beginning half, the beginning to the way more than half of my life, more than half of my life. All I was wanting was dying. All I wanted to do was die. I was in a hurry to get nowhere quick over and over and over again. I just, I knew I was a dead man walking. And at the same time, I began to experience the reality of what my life was in that I was unkillable. I was like immortal. Okay. And I, and I began to read and examine the scriptures when I finally got the ability to read, when I finally got not just, not just read because there's many people can read and they're just slaves because you need, they created a, a class of, of humans that are literally slaves because they are capable of reading, but not capable of comprehending nor communicating the information that they're taking in. And so you can create a better slave class if you give them a basic form of education and give them the illusion that they can comprehend what it is that they're taking in. But I had an incredible aptitude towards reading and comprehension very early on because I had such a hunger to know the word. It was, it was this insatiable hunger that I have. Like the last chapter of my book is called The Hunger. And like, I don't want you to skip ahead, but I totally want people to skip ahead. If you read one chapter from my book, just understand that's the one to read because that's the clinch pin. Like I got to get a sword. Hold on a second. Like, okay, this, there is like, it's a real, it's a real book. Okay. But it says it's a living book. Okay. And an active book, which means like, and it says, this is Hebrews four twelve. It says the word of Elohim is living and active, sharper than any two edged sword piercing through the soul and the spirit piercing through the, the joint and the marrow and is the discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the hearts of man. Like you can read people's mind with the word. Like I read this, I read this book because I wanted to read Hebrews 11. I wanted to read about the heroes of faith. You know, I was like, there's like a hit list of the best of the best of the best in the scriptures. And it's like right here in this, in the same book where they're talking about the most unbelievable, savage, brave warriors that have ever been. And he literally says at the end of it, he's like, Time would fail me to mention all these other people that are like written about. And you're like, who the heck are all these guys? You know, I just started reading about warriors because I wanted to fight. All I've ever wanted to do was fight. I wanted to fight because I started out my life being only able to freeze. So there's three. Okay. There's three things that happen when somebody encounters difficult situations. There's fight. There's flight. And there's freeze. This third category that so many people don't even consider. And what happens is like there's in major severe situations, right? Like firefighters go into a burning building. They start trying to get out of it because the whole structure is starting to collapse. And they get to the door to try to get out of the building. All they have to do is open the door and walk out, get out the building, right? That's all they've got to do. And they go in. Instead, they find the firefighters dead at that door. And they're like, what the heck happened? The door is unlocked. The door is unlocked and we have a trained guy who has been going in and out of fiery burning buildings, rescuing people. And he's dead at this door that all he had to do was pull it open. But the guy got in such a panic state of mind. All he could think about was get out the door, get out the door, get out the door, get out the door, trying to push the door, 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 push the door. And you're getting this mental loop where you're locked up. 
You can't think, you can't comprehend anything. They call this like condition black and all of these situational awareness trainings and stuff. You can't, your, your, your prefrontal cortex, cortex has checked out. You're not capable of thinking. You're not capable of reasoning. You poop yourself. You piss yourself. You're completely gone, right? You revert back to whatever you've been trained to do if you have any training in that regard. But you go back to this just basic level of function. Okay, your hands go numb. Like I, we used to train, like when we do like combatives and training, we used to literally train people, make them sit and sit on top of their hands so their hands were completely numb. Okay, then we would put a knife in their hands and do combative drills. Then we would put a pistol in their hands and do combatives because you have no comprehension of the level of what it's like when somebody starts shooting at you, shooting at you, trying to murder you. Okay, like direct fire at you, what you'll do when you respond. But that firefighter had nothing to do with why he died but he had everything to do with not being prepared for a single moment in time. Like he died because he didn't pull the door open. That's all he had to do to get out of there. And so many people are trapped from the day of their youth, believing because they've been conditioned from day one, that there's nothing they can do to get out of this situation. So they're frozen trying to do the same thing over and over and over again, expecting a different result. They're insane. They're literally going insane. And I was going insane at such an early age because I was seeing that there was no way out. There was no way out. I could not stop it. I could not stop these people from hurting me, hurting people around me, destroying and ravaging lives. There was nothing I could do to get out of it. But I got to hear the word being taught. I got to hear the word. And I got to hear these stories of warriors. I got to hear these stories of David. I got to hear these stories of Samson, who was a skinny guy, by the way. Everybody's been mischaracterizing this guy and playing him as some buff hero looking Zeus creature thing. Everybody didn't know who Samson was. They all sent people out to kill him. Special kill team guys, assassins. Everybody was out looking to kill Samson. And they're all like, where is that guy? If you had a yoked out broski, that was all roid rage big and buff. Nobody would have to know where he was. Everybody would know. The reason it's such an incredible, miraculous story is because nobody could identify Samson. He was a normal bro. He was nothing to regard. It's like Yeshua. Nobody looked at him. It said there was nothing about him that captivated people. Like, there was nothing to look at there. People just overlooked him, right? He was a background noise guy. And I, I, I read these studies. As soon as I could read, I read these studies as if my life depended on it because it did. Because I understood that there was an absolute physical and spiritual war that was being waged day and night for the souls of men. Like, when we were down there in the, under the London Bridge, they had throne rooms and places where these these spiritual, physical powers would come and manifest them. They would physically come into the room when people were engaged in these rituals, when children were going through these tortures. Like they physically came into the room, like literal serpent like beings, like the dragon would physically walk in the room and speak. Like people speak to these beings. There's human agents on the earth that get downloads from the kingdom of darkness that rise up out of the abyss and communicate with them. Like this is the real. It was unequivocally reality for me at such an early age that I knew I had to fight with everything in me to get out of the system, to get away from the system and to learn how to defeat it. And I knew the only solution what is ever going to be found was in that word. But at the same time, when I'd go to the churches, I saw cowards everywhere. I saw cowards and I saw compromise over and over and over and over again. So I learned helplessness. I learned that these are not the guys that you go to to get help. These are not the people that can be trusted. Like there's a chapter in my book, you're getting close to it if you haven't passed it already, where they brought a pastor in to do a spiritual deliverance because I was having so many night terrors all the time that it was becoming very uncomfortable for my family. But my family had moved in a pedophile, his, my great grandfather, and had signed my rights over so that my dad could get the inheritance from him, had moved him into the room next door to mine. And he was just destroying and ravaging me constantly. So I was terrified all the time. So they bring in a pastor to try to do a deliverance. And it just, he overlooked the monster. Like he could not even detect the total radical evil that was in his midst. And it just made me burn with rage and anger and, and a desire to dismantle this network of idiots people that were trained to be stupid, people that had gone to a society run, like who had gone to a seminary and had learned a, a weak, soft gospel that had never been given the tools that they needed to actually contend with the enemy, that actually picked up swords and cut the heads off of the wicked serpents that were crawling around and devouring the lives of the people around them. Like they didn't even know how to wield this book. And it just, it, it filled me with so much rage. And yet at the same time, like later on in the book, like I talk about this girl named Suze. I saw a 13 year old girl on a school bus who rebuked me and stopped all this demonic manifestation in a moment. She wasn't scared of me at all. She had authority. 
She was clothed with authority. The same robe of righteousness that was on the Messiah was on her. And she was not scared of any of the kingdom of darkness. She didn't turn away from it. She didn't run from it. Like she had power from on high. She understood she was immortal unless Yahuwah said otherwise. And it was true. She had an irrevocable right to life. And the only one that could take her out of that, change her position in her current standing was going to be Yahuwah Elohim Sebaoth, the Lord of hosts as I knew him at the time. Like she had a right of protection that was over her because the father says he wrote her name in his hand and no one can snatch it out of his hand. Like she understood her identity and she was walking in it. And so as my life progressed and as I began to read these stories and, and like when I was 12 years old, I read the entire scriptures from beginning to end. I was going to a private Christian school and, and I realized that there was hypocrisy everywhere. There was more hypocrisy than I'd ever seen anywhere else. And so I needed to know what the word said for myself. Because if you don't know what this book says, if you guys say you're a believer in this book and you've never read it, how the heck do you know you are? Like I challenge you that you don't say a word about what you believe until you've tested it yourself because that's the definition of foolishness. Like he who hears a matter and decides it before hearing the whole thing out, it says you're a fool in the scripture. Like you've got a book to read that's Genesis to Revelation. You can read the entire thing in about two months. I did it on an audio scriptures. I did an entire recording of the scriptures in the uh, through this microphone to try to get that to people who want to hear the word because it says faith comes from hearing and hearing comes from the word of Elohim. So like the father's not going to draw anyone to his son unless they hear his word, which means we have to clothe ourselves with an understanding of this word before we can ever go engage in warfare. And the first place all warriors have to begin is the man in the mirror, the woman in the mirror. There's nowhere else to go fight that battle except for right here in your home, in your apartment, on the side of the street, whether you're drunk or high, wherever you might be today when you watch this, there is one deal. And that's absolute surrender to the former ways of who you are. You have to give up your self-sovereignty. Like you're not the king or the queen anymore. That there's somebody else who loves you, cares about you, intimately connected with who you are, like knows your name, like actually knows your name. Not, not just your like birth certificate thing, creature, like who you are your character, your identity, your purpose, your calling, your destiny, why you're here. There's only one who knows that. And he loves you enough to reveal that to you, to show you that, and to set you free from the bondage, like these chains and these hooks and these snares. It's like all of the fear and the dread and the learned helplessness and the like, the willingness, the, the willful surrender to the kingdom of failure, like the fear of men, the fear of failure, the fear of lack, the fear of, that has so plagued us for so long. He's the only one that has the power to set you free from that, but it requires your surrender. It requires you to say, I don't know what's best for me, but I believe you because you're the one that made me does. And it's that act of faith. It's that act of, of humility. You have to be willing to humble yourself. And once you do that, once you do that, the father can exalt you. Like it says, humble yourself before the mighty hands of Elohim. Like humble yourselves, therefore, before the mighty hands of Elohim, and he will lift you up. Resist the devil, the dragon, and he will flee from you. So you have humility, trust, and then resistance. And that is like the foundation. Those are literally, you cannot stand on anything until you can apply those three fundamentals. Like there is the, the most critical thing I ever learned in my entire life about fighting and about like how to use stuff like this to absolutely eradicate my enemies was to stand like to not get to the ground to take them to the ground but to never let them get me to the ground this was like invaluable information that if i could get on their backs like i i studied how animals hunted each other i would study how how lions attacked their prey i studied how ambush predators attacked each other i studied chameleons i studied i studied praying mantises i studied wasps i studied these creatures that had different tactics and strategies to devour and destroy their prey for years and i'd watched them vigilantly and diligently i studied wolves i studied lions and cougars i studied how these animals destroy something that is so much more powerful like how do how does a cougar kill a buffalo like a buffalo is such a unique creature i literally have got buffaloes i just got skinned out and they're buffaloes giant heads on in this freezer i just went to a butcher out in missouri out here and he was showing me this this entire animal split in half my daughters we went on home dad i i take him out on a field trip you know and we end up inside of a butcher's place and they're just sawing an animal completely in half in front of them and they're like wow 
I have a seven-year-old and a four-year-old daughter. They're in here watching. They're like, oh yeah. The bone saw was going less than a foot from their face. It was amazing. It was totally explicitly graphic and authentic because I'm like, if you guys want to eat meat, you should definitely be intimately connected with that process. But he was showing me the difference in the, ana the just the anatomical differences between the buffalo and the cow. And buffaloes have this, this giant hump on their back that's all this ribs and muscles. And they do that, they grew that way because the father put them in this incredible environment here in North America in a land full of saber tooth tigers, like saber tooth lions. Their, their fangs are just like gigantic and they just destroy things and they jump on their backs and they just go for the throat, right? And buffaloes drop their neck and their shoulders and they got horns and they just destroy stuff that gets on their back. And so like I learned at a very young age, like you just got to make sure to stay on the top. Like you got to stay on top. If you hold that control and that power in that position, you can destroy anybody. And Amos 2.9 was where I found that. Like I studied the scriptures for any, any verse that had to do with battle, attack, tactics combat and in amos 2 9 it said how they defeated these giants by the way which were like living trees huge 30 60 80 feet gigantic beings and it said they attacked them from their roots beneath and their fruit above and i was like this is exactly how we dismantle this empire i was like if i want to completely eradicate this entire kingdom of darkness those are the two places i got to go i got to go for their roots and i got to go for their fruits and he said behold i send you out as sheep among wolves be careful right but you'll know them by their fruits so we've got all these masquerading sheep out there that are lying, that really are inwardly ravenous wolves, but we can always look and examine their fruits and they'll never be able to hide. So once we can clearly identify our targets, we can then go for their feet, go for the roots. And this is how we can completely eradicate this thing. And this is how spiritual warfare truly must be engaged. If we ourselves have not purged this evil from our midst, if we have not cleansed our root systems, like, I love that you're a farmer because you're totally going to get where I'm going with this. Like the, the beauty of plants is that they capture this incredible resource known as light and they convert it into physical nutrients like sugars. It's incredible what a chloroplast like chloroplast and chloroplast like they convert sunlight into energy, into food. They take in carbon dioxide and they breathe out oxygen. Like it's an incredible thing, but then they have something called root exudates. Like they take in all this nutrients and if they're in a healthy soil rich, like good, good environment, they're going to release nutrients back into the soil to feed the bacteria, the rhizome, the bacteria, the fungi, the, the, like all these little bugs that are down there under the ground that you don't even see or think about that really rule the world. They feed it back to them. They feed their excess down to them. And they, in turn, go and mine all kinds of resources in the soil that they can't get, that they can't do. And they pump that out through their roots. And this is what happens is if a man and a woman submits themselves to the truth, to the ways of righteousness, you begin to drink in the sun of righteousness. Like you begin to bask in the light of his face. Like the father no longer has his face turned from you, but it says he turns his face towards you. He inclines his ears towards you. Like he listens when you cry. And he sends deliverance. He sends help. He sends reinforcements to you. Like he is capable and culpable. He is capable of delivering you when you call to him. Like that's why the words in Psalm 91 are so powerful. Like he who dwells in the shelter of the most high shall abide in the shadow of El Shaddai. Like I will say of Yahuwah, my fortress, my stronghold, my rock in whom I trust. He will deliver you from the snare of the fowler, from the deadly pestilence. Like he is, he is your shield and your exceedingly great reward. And when you have that, that belief, that conviction, you can walk in his authority because he said greater things you're going to do on this earth than he did. And so when I read that, I actually believe that. And then I go live it. I go live it because I understand this is a real weapon of our warfare. Like I can take this and build houses. I started doing that down in Florida, building with primitive materials, houses with machetes, tools that I had only ever used for killing, tools that I had only ever known violence through, I got to turn into something of benefit that added value to the people around me that grew and cultivated fruit and tomatoes. I became a master tomato vine dresser down there. And I got to learn how to build, how to add life to an area with a tool that I had only ever known for destruction. And that is how this book can be such a fierce two-edged sword because with it, you can bring love and truth. With it, you can bring life and you can bring death. And it is the most powerful tool that has ever been entrusted to man is this living word. And it says in John 1.1, 1, 1, Yeshua, Yeshua is the word. In the beginning was the word. And the word was Elohim. And the word was with Elohim. Like he was there from the beginning. He, Yahuwah gave us his deliverance. He showed us the mightiest of mighty men. And he then gave us from beginning to end this word and by those words we live and by our words we're either going to be justified or by our words we're going to be condemned so when we want to contend when we want to be warriors all we have to do is first submit ourselves to his ways and then learn 
and model our life off the lives that we see in this book. There's good guys in there. There's bad guys in there. But you know what? All throughout it, there is one ultimate warrior. And that is the one that we need to imitate. That is the one we want to have his mind on. And he showed us the way to contend against this. He had a zealousness for his father's house. And he utterly detested hypocrisy. Wolves in sheep's clothing, these brood of vipers. Like he went after them and he didn't give them an inch to flee from. And you know what? He gave his life as a ransom to many. And he was a hero to the nations. And they hated him for it. Don't seek the crowd. Don't seek the conveniences. Don't seek the comfort, but seek to be warriors who are imbued from power on high to boldly contend against the kingdom of darkness, wherever it is, whether it's in our hearts and in our homes or whether it's out there abroad. We were born for a time as this. Yes, absolutely. That sheds some, some good light that a physical confrontation can be overcome by a spiritual submission and weaponry. So um, basically, I'm going to ask you a clarifying question on that, but it's yeah. so it's so amazing because I this is confirmation exactly what you just said to a YouTube video that I made like a year or two ago. And the title of that YouTube video was called Why I Quit Going to Church. Mm. And it's it's really amazing how dimensionally you can have the knowledge that I had when I made that YouTube video, which is more like a feeling. And I just had to try and verbally manifest what it was that I was feeling. And there was just that mixed with some type of righteousness that I, that was welling up within me. And I, I, I was, um, I honored and was bold and I just threw caution to the wind and I came out with it and I pressed publish and I, and I named the church by name because mm. I forget where in scripture it says to do it. I think Paul said to do it or something, but um, it's, it's amazing how the dimensional aspect of this is because now revisiting this and hearing you talk about the big church, basically a bunch of funny bones that went to school and have good hearts, but just are totally missing how deep this systemic evil goes and what extents you have to become as a spiritual warrior to identify and neutralize the opposition and it speaks directly to what I was getting to getting at in this YouTube video. But now as I revisit it with, with your context, I realize that there truly is a difference between Christians with good hearts who think that they're doing what they're doing and the remnant that are spiritual warriors that are connected to the one most high source, Yeshua Messiah, and have almost an entire new veil lifted off from them and they just live life differently. And it's so different compared to what we think Christian church is now or any de denomination that people get weirded out from it. I'm one of those people. I had someone when I was first popping off with my content, you know, I've got millions of followers. When I was first starting to pop off, I had this pepper farmer from, from the South somewhere and his family want to reach out and come meet me at the family farm. You know, this wasn't even at my house at the time. This is my family's house. And, um, he practiced the Sabbath and his kids were obviously homeschooled. You could tell they were just different. And the whole thing was just weird to me. It was different, but I didn't judge them. You know, I didn't, it didn't freak me out so bad that I felt unsafe, but it was different and it was uncomfortable because I looked at them different, but in retrospect, I don't know these people's lives enough to validate whether or not this is the exact case. But in retrospect, I realize this dude was different because he was closer. He was, he was on a whole nother level, a whole nother playing field. And that leads me to this clarifying question, given this dimension of understanding, given how faith is a journey and it's multifaceted in a physical confrontation. And I know that you know this because in your testimony, you said, while you were getting away from the family, um, there was circumstances where, you know, that God was real because you would see tracking softwares get totally ruined or masked or people couldn't see you or your family right in front of their face, like physically, like with eyeballs and you're there and they're there and they don't react to you being there or um, just like going through a movie theater and seeing dark, sketchy cars pull up and having to make split section second decisions on how you're going to keep yourself and your wife alive. Like, when you're in those moments and you don't have time to go flip through the pages of scripture or you are in that freeze, 
that no one seems to know about because it's just fight or flight. And you don't have time to, to contemplate. And your, your instinct, fleshly instinct, is to defend yourself with your facilities that you've recognized with your whole entire life. What is it? Is it the Father's grace that leads you to fight that battle spiritually and save you from other things? Is it something that just happens and you're thankful for that grace? Or is it a, a mindful decision that you have to train and discipline yourself so that when that time comes, you know what to do? That's a great question. The, you prepare for it every day of your life without even realizing it. By putting this word in you, you're prepared. It says the power source, like the powerhouse that comes on you is so beyond any weaponry. Let me show you my favorite stinking weapon for a second. Okay. This, I got handed one of these at an air show back in uh, Arizona when I was young. Okay. This is a 30 millimeter round. This comes off of a, of a weapons platform called the GAU-8 Avenger. It is a 30 millimeter Gatling gun, but it's, but it's mechanized, right? So people call it like mini guns. There's an M134, which is a smaller version. This thing, they built a plane, an entire plane. They designed it around the weapon system of this because it shoots 3,000 of these every minute. Like unbelievable. This thing has so much power when it shoots that the plane slows down. It's called an A-10 Warthog. It's been around since the 70s. It was designed to kill tanks. Like to just only one thing continually, close air support, murdering tanks. That was it. I was like, this is the greatest thing I've ever held in my life. When somebody handed this to me, I love weapons. Like, shockingly, I'm so way too much. I love super dense, heavy stuff. I love exotic materials and metals and stuff. Anyways, these things, they used to put depleted, they still do, by the way. They put depleted uranium in it because uranium is an incredibly, ridiculously dense substance. And when it shoots into something, it has some, they call it self-sharpening. But basically, instead of mushrooming out, it kind of creates more and more of a point, a needle point to penetrate armor. And this, this entire projectile, they built a plane to only use this tool with unbelievable effectiveness and ferocity. Like every time I think about power, like I think about what they call like a force multiplier, you know, like guy shows up in a gunfight and one guy brings a tank. It's just hysterical. In the United States military, we had days where we would just sit around in basic combat training in Fort Knox, Kentucky, and we just watched videos of people getting killed in crazy ways. That was it. Just day, like a day, just sitting there watching videos from inside combat of people getting killed. And it was like, there was videos of, of men versus tanks, lots of those, like real close up, high definition footage of what happened when somebody got hit by a tank round. They're like shooting an AK, and then the tank hits them. You know, that's a force multiplier. And it's so overwhelmingly shock and awe. Like it's so just insanely incongruent. It's like people with sticks fighting guys with bazookas. Like it's a real thing. It happens around the world regularly. Like people literally like go back to study the Zulu Wars. This book, this is one of my favorite books to talk about with. It's called The uh, War in the Shadows. And uh, Robert Asprey wrote this. This is all about guerrilla warfare and resistance fighters, right? Insurgencies, they call them today. But this goes all the way back to like Macedonia. It goes all the way back to time. People that fought people that had way more power my girls want to say hello. This is Naomi. This is Jubilee, my daughter. There's Naomi behind me. You can hang out. Hold on. <laughs> these Hi, are Jubilee. my force multipliers. Hold on. Yeah. These are, these are my force multipliers, right? Yeah. In the Psalms, it says that children are an inheritance from Yahuwah. Like, they are the fruit of the womb is your reward. Like, arrows in the hands of a mighty man are the children are one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. Like he will not turn back from his enemies. Like he will sit with his enemies in the gates. Like your children become a powerhouse for you, like a whole other arsenal of resources. And by having, by my wife having that child in her womb, it made me a different human instantly. I never, I never fought so hard in my life as I fought because of them. Like it made me a different man entirely, but that's, that was my why all that changed was my why I had a reason to fight. I had a reason to resist. I had a reason to contend. I had a reason to fight back, to not just go quietly into the night anymore. And when, when that showdown happened in that, in that parking lot, when my wife was seven and a half months pregnant, my family sent assassins after us, teams of assassins after us to kill my wife and I. And I was wearing body armor. I was, I was concealed carrying a pistol at the time. I was decked to the nines with knives, man. I could feel them coming. Like 
I walked out of those doors. I walked out of those doors and out of into that parking lot and I could feel death. Like there, there is a spiritual sulfur in the air when death comes in. Like people think it's just a physical thing you're fighting when, when there's guys shooting guns at you, when there's, when there's people who are coming to try to assassinate or kill somebody else or murder somebody else. There is a spiritual power that comes upon people that goes all the way back to Cain that is requirement, that is always present when death is, when there is hatred and murder. Like Yeshua said, if any of you hate someone in your heart, you've already committed murder. There's a spiritual poison, a toxin, a spirit of murder and rage and hatred and violence and lust that comes on people and you can detect it. And it's because he says he gives you one of the, the powerhouse that he gives you is his Holy Spirit, his set apart spirit. Like in Hebrew, it says the rock Hakodesh. It just sounds so much mightier than Holy Spirit, you know, or Holy Ghost. I it's just like this is something that is a powerhouse. The word is dynamite. Like literally, he says, when power comes on you from on high, it, the word is literally dynamite. Like we don't even think about it, but inside this is like a stick of dynamite. And I've got it right here next to my children, right? Think about the power that's contained in here that's under self-control. I can drop this thing. I could throw this thing around. It's not going to go off. And even if it does, you know what? It'll make a bang, but it's not going to do the same. It will never go through a tank. I can throw this thing in a fire and it's not going to explode and send shrapnel everywhere. This only works when you give it into the right system and you could put this in a chamber and fire it off. And now all that pressure is forced through this tiny little space and goes down the barrel in a single direction. And then it's going 2,500 feet per second and it's causing an utterable destruction on the end of it. And that is what happens when righteous men and women, humble people, people that understand that there is no power on this earth that can, that can fight against this kingdom of radical intelligent evil. We are outnumbered, outgunned, outfinanced, surrounded on every side. We are in an absolute unwinnable war unless there is some power that is completely superior, unless there is an actual authority, an aleph, like an aleph, you, like in Hebrew, it's the first letter in the alphabet is the Aleph. And that literally is like the great Buffalo, like the greatest, most powerful creature that has ever been that one that sets its eyes forward and it never moves. Like there is an all sufficient one, omniscient, omnipresent, the judge of all the earth. And what he says is reality. What he says will absolutely come to pass. He said he guards, watches over his word to see it come to pass. And like when I stepped out of that theater, I was clothed with that power from on high. And I had instant peace, a peace that surpassed understanding. Like I was clothed with, with a, a focus, an attentiveness, a sharpness that is, that is beyond anything, any drug I ever had in the military. That was better than any high I ever had. It was an absolute confidence that all I had to do was exactly what he told me to, which was to obey his voice, follow his lead, do what he said. And if he said, run, we run. If he said, stand, we stand. If he said, fight, we fight. And you know what? He fought for us. He sent spiritual powers. He sent his angels, his messengers ahead of us to cause their weapons to jam. As they began to come in towards my wife and I and pull their pistols out, I watched them raise those things to try to shoot at us. And I saw them jam and I saw them dropping the magazines and trying to cycle the action and being unable to cycle the action and reload. I watched as team, second tier team operators rose up in a truck to try to shoot at my wife and I and his weapon jam. And we got in our vehicle and turned around and began to go the other way out of the parking lot and there was a back guy a final guy who was the, the dragnet and he had a glock in his hand and as he passed in front of my headlights he looked at my wife and i with unmistakable dread fear terror absolute desire to just get away and it wasn't me like it was not my wife that he was scared of it was the one who was with us and he who was with us was greater than any of them ever could know because that is the all consuming fire. That is the power that can clothe you from on high. And like every time we have run into one of these physical attacks that's come against my wife and I, he has given my wife and I absolute discernment to know exactly what to do and to just obey him. 
And if you do that, you're free. But if you disobey, you die. It's very simple. It's like when you go to a high ropes course and they're teaching you how to belay down the side of a mountain. And if you listen to their voice, you live. And if you disobey their voice, you will die. It is absolutely life or death in that regard. But if you do that, he will card you and protect you from any level of threat that could ever imagine to come your way. David, the reason I knew that was because I studied David so hard. And it said every day for the entirety of Saul's life after he lost the kingdom from Samuel, Every day he thought of ways to kill King David. Every day of his life, Saul, with a spear in his hand, thought of ways to kill David. And every day, Yahuwah preserved his life all the way. That is no one can take you out of his hand. But that power that came on me was not mine. There was no amount of intellect and skills and training. I have never had to fire a weapon at these people. I have never had to kill another person. I have seen the father rebuke them and drive them away from us time and again. But that doesn't mean we don't have to hit our knees and be disciplined to seek his face and to guard ourselves, guard ourselves from the spiritual seduction, the physical seductions that try to come in and lead us astray. Yeah. People need to hear that message. People need to know that that exists. People need to hear someone that has went from one extreme of the spectrum to the other, um, lay it all out because, in this world of, I'm going to say, uh, big church, I'm just going to keep on using the word big church because I think people know what it means by now. It's, it's a real thing. It's a real thing that pastors try to, you know, talk on a non sermon stage type environment. And, you know, they, they will say things that sound confident, but it's just, it's one of those things that it's like where the, the meat meets the marrow, like, mm -hmm. We need to know that the God that we serve is the all-consuming fire and he can make weapons jam and he will provide a way out. And you don't need to hold on to your pistol in order to save your own life, even if people can use their free will. And that right there, that's the ticket. That's the hot word. That's the hot key. Um, I thought for the longest time that every single person was given free will. And they can use that free will to inflict massive amounts of evil. And where I was wrong is our free will, no matter how many evil actions someone is capable of and does, even against the innocent, will never be able to overpower the Lord's free will. Hmm. And if we call upon that in a situation where a man is using his free will and Yahweh is using his free will, Yahweh will win every single time. And that's all you need to know. Like, yeah. that's the source code. That's, I, I could call things cheat codes. I, I would hate to say that specific term in this context, but people need to know that. That's a very important thing because when you look around and what's going on today in this day and age, like it is wild thing. Everything is on fire. Um, mm -hmm. People are reverting to revolution. People are reverting to hitting the gun range to try and protect them and theirs. And it's so easy as someone that, you know, is just a good old boy or someone that's a farmer and, you know, just wants to do what's right for their family, even to the very end. It's so easy because that's everyone's first instinct. And it's so powerful to know that there's a stronger weapon and it's accessible through the words of our mouth. Mm -hmm. That blows my muffin cap back blue because you have lived it. This is your testimony and God was with you. That's so much more powerful than any other message that's being preached on stages right now. The fact that God will save your life. He will step in every single time and he will do what needs to be done. It yes. just, it blows my mind. It's such a peace knowing that. And that's Psalm 4 two says, I will lay down in peace. Because you, oh, Yahuwah, are with me. Like, mommy prays that over you a lot, doesn't she? He will make us lie down in peace. And that was the ultimate quest for me was I wanted I wanted to lay down and sleep in peace. I didn't want to be dr filled with dread. I had so much dread every night. Like, I, I ran to so much substance use to try to drown out the dread of the night. Like, the dreams, the nightmares, the... The, the restlessness that was in my soul. Like, I, as soon as I could own a pistol... Like, and, and conceal carry it all the time. Like I've had people try to shoot out my windows before, like shoot me in the head. Let's just put, put it super transparently. I had people try to shoot me in the head 
And instead of it hitting my head, it hit the, I had a, a Honda Civic that was like a hatchback, you know, and it missed me, my head by less than two feet. It, it was exactly at my head level and it shot out the back, my back window. And like there, this is a game of millimeters. I, we try to explain to people like the art of using, like we just call it the art of killing. You know, I didn't, I never played martial arts. Like I never played combative game. I didn't play sports in that sense. Like I don't train in gyms with guys who put on pads and stuff like that. All I ever did was kill them. Like I didn't, there was no like, Oh, well let me just stop before I break your neck. There was, there was zero of that. You know, it was not a, there was never a game aspect to any of it. It was absolute, complete, all in, never hold back, like kill or be killed. There was no in between. There was no like 50% stuff. There was a hundred percent absolute perfection. Like the difference between a killing blow landing on somebody and a wounding blow landing on somebody is millimeters. And if you get that wrong one time, you're absolutely a hundred percent dead. And this is, this is the reality of this game, this real life war that we are in is that we are all sitting here on the precipice of the entire thing burning to the ground around us. The, there, is a, there is a desire, there is a leeching into the atmosphere of violence. There's a leeching into the atmosphere of, of, like you said, revolution. But this is such an abomination. Like people have no idea what the word means. Like does your tire do one revolution? How often? Like a, a revolution means you go in a circle. It means you go back to where you came from and you go back to where you're going. Like it's the opposite of there's a difference between a revolution and a revival. A revival is something entirely other than a revolution because you don't get it. There, these words, these semantics, these, these mind games that they're playing with people is to foment in them, to give them uh, an outlet for an expression and they're controlling the narrative on both sides of the equation. They're giving people a, a split dichotomy of options that there's only two options. They're like, you can be on the left wing of the Phoenix or the right wing, but you can't be in the middle. You know, like it's an illusion. Y'all people are looking for political messiahs out there. They're looking for somebody to physical human people to rise up and set them free and save their lives and be their heroes again. But you can't put your faith in men. You can't put your faith in your firearms. Like, y'all, I know how good and effective a firearm can be in a firefight. But let me tell you, there is so much better that is that is left with you when you don't have blood all over your body. Like, it's so much better that you don't have to let your children see you commit an absolute unleashing of violence on another human being in front of their face to defend them. And I'm not saying that's the wrong choice of action. I'm saying it's the last resort. Because what comes next, y'all, if none of you, have, the vast majority of people who are preparing for this have no idea about what the intimacy of killing is. There is a real important book you all should study and read called On Killing. On Killing. It was, it's a, it walks you through the human side of killing and the resistance that's hardwired into all of us to not want to kill each other. And he studies this, this author who is, I believe was a colonel in the United States military studied every, like every war and battle to try to figure out a conundrum that military trainers have had forever, which was how do we get people to move and leave their resistance to killing other people behind and become murderers? Like I tell people all the time, soldiers are trained murderers. That's what you are. And they do this by dehumanizing the enemy, right? That's one step of it. Then they do a whole lot of mind control through sleep deprivation, through physical exertion. They're trying to program this, this interior space of your brain so that when you are in those situations, when you get in that firefight and you revert back to this baseline human, that what's in there was the stuff they programmed in there was that you would react in a way that was responding towards the training that you had instilled in you. But in order to do that, they have to change you completely from out of the image of man that you were made to be out of the, out of the image of Yahuwah that you were made to be carrying on this earth and to make you like a beast, to make you a monster. And when you let that out, when you let that in, it's, it's an unstoppable force that comes into most people. Most people are not, most people are not going to be able to sleep well after that. Most people are not going to be able to sit down and have a meal with their family and look each other's in the eyes when they're covered in brain matter after that. There is, a, there is an absolute changing that takes place in someone. And you know what? Some of you will get addicted to it. Some of you will be crushed by it. Some of you will be ruined because of it. And you'll understand why 90% of soldiers lose their marriage after they go to combat. 90% of them come home and there's no more home to come home to because they're never the same. Like you're never the same after that moment when you have engaged in absolute violence against another human being, you're forever different. 
Meanwhile, everybody else just keeps going on with this Truman show. And you can't mm-hmm. participate in the same kingdom anymore, which is why they go out and get hooked on so many drugs. Like I used to self-regulate through substances continually. I was hacking my way to s- just some level of a baseline of functioning continually. Like it literally led me until my 30s to where I had to read the scriptures and find out, is there any cure for addictions in the Bible? Like, is there anything that's in here for somebody who's completely addicted? And like I found at every, there's a book called The Spiritual Roots of Disease, um, Dr. Er, or A More Excellent Way is the book, actually the title of the book, A More Excellent Way, one of the best, best books you can ever read to try to understand the spiritual roots of disease. And he has a section in there on addictions, and he said all addictions, all addictions are rooted in the need to be loved. The fundamental. Mm. Everybody who has an addiction, whatever your drug of choice is, whether it's the video games that you're total slaves to, whether it's the pornography, whether it's the alcohol, whether it's whatever it may be, y'all, it is rooted in your need to be loved. And like that, that began to set me free so powerfully. And I found in the scriptures in, in Numbers chapter six, it says, if any of you desire to be more set apart to Yahuwah, you can take this vow and it's called a Nazarite vow. And in that vow, you separate yourselves from three things fundamentally, death, alcohol, or any fruit of the vine, mind altering substances, right? And your, your vanity, your figure, how you look, your hair, right? It's like, don't cut your hair. Don't touch anything dead. Don't even go to a funeral. Don't go be around death at all. And don't touch anything that alters your state of consciousness. Like we read about Samson. We're like, yeah, he was a Nazarite from his womb. You know, like, you're like, what is that? What is that actually about? And it's a way to set yourself free from that. It's a way that you physically get a reminder that your body is not just your own anymore. Like some people wear their wedding rings and they look down on that and they're like, wow, like you're, you're freshly married. Is that right? I am. So you're going to be like looking like, it's, it's a new thing, and you have this new reminder to be like, you're not your own anymore. The decisions you make absolutely forever will be connected to in a decision that affects your wife. Her decisions that she makes now forever affect you. Like, you're no longer your own. You were bought with a price. Like, this is the reality for your life. And that, that chapter, taking a vow like that, helped to set me free that my body doesn't just belong to me anymore. And that I had accountability that was way better than any AA program. Like I worked in substance abuse and addictions and treatments and wilderness therapy programs and, and transitional living and rehabs. And like I was always trying to figure out a way to help people with addictions. And ultimately, I was like, there is no physical way I can help these people with addictions. Like if people don't know that they are loved, that there is like a king of love, like truly that they that can have an absolute intimate relationship with them that can satisfy their desires that no man, no woman, no substance could ever give you. Like there is no cure for that. The only cure is going to come from an outside agent delivering us from that. And there is such a strong addiction to violence. There's such a, a strong addiction to fighting back. And that's not wrong. That's not wrong. Hey, sweetheart, I love you so much. You want to take a bet? Okay, you can sleep right here. That's fine. There is... There is that need for people to fight back. There, there are men who want to be warriors. There are men who are tired and exhausted and worn out of seeing corrupt kingdoms continually ravaging them day and night. Like there's a good fight still left in a lot of people, but they got to understand that there's more effective strategies to doing that versus just turning to this stuff. Like I love, I love these types of tools, y'all. It's not that I'm going to tell every one of you to go sell your cloak and buy a sword. I genuinely recommend you actually buy a sword, like buy a sword, pick up a tool that you can use on an ongoing perpetual continual basis. Like carry a neck knife, carry a knife and use that every single day. And I'll tell you, if the father ever really wants you to be an overpowering force of righteous vengeance on the earth, he can do more with you in this than you can ever do on your own with your perfect battle platform go to war setup. You know what I'm saying? Like I did more killing and effective destruction of my enemies with tiny little knives like this than I ever did with the most advanced ballistic platforms that were ever entrusted me in the United States military, like desert tech tools. Like I had high tech, high, low speed, high, high, high tech, beautiful weaponry systems entrusted to me. And you know what I found? I always went back to this because this was what I knew and I was familiar with. Y'all be scratching your nose with this finger all the time. You know how to use your own finger all the time. And if you put a knife that's about that length in your hand and you want to contend against somebody, nobody's going to stop you, y'all. Like there's these guys in the book of Judges who killed a thousand people with the fresh jawbone of a donkey. I shot a a donkey in the head, man. I understood what their jaw was like. And I understood it was a miracle to kill a thousand people in hand-to-hand combat with this bone. I was holding like this. This is a total miracle. There's a guy who killed 600 people with an ox goat. It's a stick. 
It's a stick, a 10 foot stick with a little bit of nublet on the metal on the end of it. That's a miracle. There are so many incredible miracles of the father raising up people with the tools in their hand. Like Moses, Moses killed the entire army of the most advanced kingdom on the face of the earth with a stick in his hand, y'all. Like he did nothing, but he had the word of Elohim and he went with the authority that was given to him. And he used the tool that was in his hand, which was one staff. Like there's this guy, Benaiah, he's one of the Gibberim. I have a playlist called Becoming a Gibberim, which is all about becoming a mighty man of valor. That's what that word is. If you ever see mighty man or courageous man, that's the Gibberim, man. That's, that's Yahuwah's green berets. That's his special forces, y'all. That's the, the mighty, mighty men of valor, right? Like the men we want to be, we ought to be, we ought to strive to that. That, those men, there's one of them, he's called Benaiah. And it says that he killed an Egyptian giant with nothing but a staff in his hand. And he went and took the spear out of his hand and killed him with it. He climbed into a pit with a lion on a snowy day and slew him. He killed lion faced men of Moab, like hybrids with literal lion head. If they said they could fight with a thousand men, they could outrun gazelles. Like they were supernaturally empowered hybrids. They were the most effective killing systems on the earth. And he killed one of them. And you're like, how? Because he was anointed and appointed and he had the word of Elohim and the foundation and he had some piss and vinegar. He had his balls on him. His testosterone was raging with him and he took those convictions and he submitted to the king of glory and he walked in his ways and he modeled David. David killed tens of thousands of people. People sang that, that, that song about him everywhere he went because in David stepped onto a battlefield, tens of thousands of people were going to die. That's a warrior. But you know what? That same guy repented for cutting a single corner off of King Saul's robe. He repented for doing that instead of assassinating him because he understood that there was a chain of command. And if he broke the words of his father, he would lose that. He would be revoked. So you all have decisions you have to make. You have your own battle plans you have to make. And you know what? I have mine. And I have chosen to surrender my sword to him, which is what David did with the sword of Goliath. It says he took the head of Goliath and his sword and armor with him into his tent, and he took it to Jerusalem. But we find that sword of Goliath was in the house of Yahuwah, wrapped in a linen ephod behind the mercy seat. Like they had, he had surrendered it to Yahuwah. Basically like, you know what? I want to use these to hunt dragons. Full disclosure. I want to prepare an arsenal and an armory to fight in this absolute inevitable war. But you know what? I surrendered it to him. And I said, you know what? I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to give you all of my weapons. And I'm going to say, I'm not going to touch those unless you call me to it and you appoint me to it. Otherwise, I'm going to go study this and learn how to wield this sword so that in every bu bullet that I ever stored, I better learn a Bible verse for every bullet I kept. Because if I can't keep this word written on my heart, if I can't keep these words clothing me with power from on high, I have no business entering in to a war of eternal consequences. And he said the Holy Spirit was better that the Holy Spirit comes because he would lead men to remember every word he said, the spirit of truth. Yeshua himself was like, it's better I go. Because the one who's coming after me, he will give you power from on high. He will clothe you. He will give you irrevocable immortality, indestructible immortality. And he will bring to remembrance every word he said. So when I've been engaged in these wars, when I've been engaged in these battles, spiritual battles, physical battles on this earth, those words come roaring to my mind like I've never experienced ever in my life. I, am, I, I, I literally feel like I am on fire. Like I, I feel like if I open my mouth, I could consume my enemies with these words that come out of me. And I've seen it done time and again. And I've seen the enemy flee from it like, like they were on fire. But I can't see it with these eyes, but I can experience it with my body. I can experience it with these senses that I have. But I know that is how we're supposed to fight this war. And until such a time as that changes, we have to eagerly study, discipline, train ourselves to be righteous men of Yah who've submitted to his will and walk in obedience because then we truly are unstoppable. Amen. That is very powerful. And um, I'm actually reading in Samuel right now when uh, I was just talking about the order today in my kitchen. And I was talking with my wife and my mother came over and I referenced how Saul was after David. And time and time and again, he would try to kill him and he would get in situations where David would literally, you know, take his water jug or he would cut his robe and pretty much tell Saul, you know, if I wanted you dead, you would be, here's your, here's proof. And the fact that David understood that Saul was God's anointed one. And even though Saul was trying to do pure evil, he was trying to uh, kill David with this like demonic lust that he had in this spell, which Yahweh was fully aware of that. I mean, he wasn't blind 
to Saul having the intentions of murder. Hmm. But then again, he was still the anointed king of Israel. And the fact that David knew that he couldn't hurt him because he was God's anointed one, even though he was doing evil and he was trying to kill David, like how much more physical and carnal does that get? Someone is trying to eliminate you. Someone's bringing men trained to kill and trying to kill you. And you have the discipline and you have the composure to not only not retaliate, but like play cat and mouse with it to the point where you're just letting the Lord do miracle after miracle after, and you're just trusting your, your amount of trust. Like how close was God in David that he trusted that hard and he was that disciplined that he knew he couldn't touch Saul. Mm -hmm. And it was like this tightrope that he walked and the order plays part in, in my life specifically because I am only 28 years old. I am not the patriarch of my family. However, you know, the spiritual growth that I have and the understanding of scripture and just kind of how my life is played out, just constantly being the, the oldest sibling, you know, the oldest cousin, pretty much the, the, the wisest one of the family, if you will, in some regards, it's hard for me to understand order that the people that are elder, like you said, when someone has white hair, you're supposed to stand up. Like mm -hmm. there's an order to things. And if you don't mm -hmm. understand that order, it's really easy to think that you're being righteous or to think that it's your place or to think that this, that, and the other, when the whole time you're being ignorant because God has an order and that order is so important because without it doesn't matter how out of line someone is, doesn't matter what the situation might mean without that order, everything is lost because it's no longer God's way. And, um, I kind of want to abruptly segue into a different question because I think that you have beautifully orchestrated and um, kind of discussed that whole modality of thinking when it comes to fight, flight, freeze, trusting God's word, putting on the armor, being wielded in the uh, weaponry of spirituality. And just to kind of put that one to bed, mm -hmm. Yahweh the creator, the architect of the universe and everything that is now and will ever be, he has the weapons of warfare and he has everything all done up. And all we have to do is just rely on that. So um, one of the questions, I have literally four pages of questions from reading your book. Um, phenomenal, guys. If you guys have not seen this copy anywhere I'm going to make it flash across the screen real quick. You guys need to go um, pick this book up. Amazon, 1995, best 20 bucks you ever spent. Um, four pages of questions. And we're obviously not going to get to all of them. Fire, but one of them fire them off. All right. <laughs> we, I mean, we can rapid fire them. <laughs> one of the questions is about your grandfather. So I'm just going to read this question. How do you believe these high-ranking Luciferian people like your grandfather were unaware that they were being played? Delusion and deception are one thing, but how does radical, intelligent evil fall for the lie of the one they serve? What do they believe happens to them when they die? And I know that there was a term that you used called something like eliopsism or something where you know, they will equal the glory of the evil one that they serve. But basically what the question I'm trying to understand is uh, dimensionally, you have these people, they're intelligent. They're, they're manipulating with a, a sharp intelligence and they must know, like when they go to bed at night or they have quiet time or they, you know, have moments of introspection, like they must know that they're getting played because the whole thing is stacked against itself. Can you speak to that a little bit? The, the fundamental crux of it is that pride blinds. Pride is this insidious root that conceals and, and veils. It. it says Solomon, right? People are like, the wisest man that ever lived, right? It said, he's like, knowledge puffs up. And like, you can get filled with this knowledge and you get filled with this, this ancient hate that makes you believe the same narrative 
that allowed Halal ben Shahar, right? People call him Lucifer, this modern juncture term they gave to him, this anointed cherub that covered that over, like in the throne room of the Most High, like the guardian. He was supposed to be the guardian of the throne. Like, but he looked upon the Father, he looked upon him and saw and began to desire the power, desire the glory, desire the reverence, desire the worship that he should be like the most high. Like he began to raise himself up in his heart. And it says iniquity was found in him. Like he was the conception point. He gave birth to iniquity, which was not just like sin, not just like transgression. Like iniquity was like the willful, continual giving yourself over to darkness he was supposed to be this just great, radiant, awesome, majestic, incredible creature destined for glory. However, Yahuwah is the only one who's ever going to receive the glory. But then there's this lust, lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. These are the three funda fundamental things that make every one of us either win or or lose our souls. And there is an entire kingdom that exists behind the scenes to control and manipulate and govern men, master manipulators. We don't think about these principalities and powers and rulers and, and thrones and spiritual wickedness and high plate. We don't think of them as physical, real things that we're battling against, but these are the immortals. They have been around since before we were. They have had all kinds of time and millennia to study human behavior. They are the most effective at manipulating individuals to give them this blinding over their eyes and over their ears so they cannot even come to the truth. So that even though my grandfather, like, he's and he's still alive to this day. He's still alive to this day, and he's still doing the same thing as long as he's been doing. Like, he never stops. And you're like, how, how can you be still willing to go and commit these types of radical evil, knowing all of this, knowing that at the end of it is absolute inevitability? Like my great grandfather, the one who was just brought in to, to, to shatter me as a young teenager and perpetuate my learned helplessness. Like I walked into the room with him when he was dead. Like I got to see his body and I got to feel him cold as ice. And like, I can't even tell you how long I waited for that moment. I can't even tell you how much I'd fantasized about it and thought about it. And all I wanted to do was to see what he was seeing in that moment. I wanted to see what he saw. I wanted to know what he felt because there's an absolute irrevocable inevitability for every person on this earth that they are going to be brought before the judge of all the earth. Like you want to read something terrifying? Psalms 94, judge of the earth, give the proud what they deserve. There, there is an absolute inevitable throne th that everyone's going to, and it is a guaranteed destruction of every lie, every falsehood, every vain imagination, every puffed up feeling in them. It's going to come undone. They will be disintegrated before him. But you know what? I really believe they have been given over to a false identity, to an, to an inability to know the truth. Because at the end of the day, you can't wrestle with it. There's so much darkness behind that. Like how, There is so much compromise. They don't want to touch it. They don't want to touch. They sincerely won't touch. It. Like, I've driven around some of the most powerful and influential people. I've been a bodyguard for kings and sovereigns around this world. Like they, they don't want to deal with the man in the mirror. So they avoid it. It's the same sin that Adam had. He avoided the dragon in the garden. He should have contended with him right then and there and put him to death. He should have rebuked him, but he abdicated his responsibility and sent in his wife instead. And like we, we fail to confront the monster who's in the mirror and they are just as afraid of dealing with with it because they cannot come to grips with the irrevocable destruction that has happened in their life and what they've done to others. The, like the, uh, the stack of bodies is so high that they get to a place where their consciences are genuinely seared. Like when you cauterize a nerve, you, caught, you burn it off so it'll never send the signal again. And that's literally what's happened. They have burned themselves so completely that their bodies are just shells. They're, they're literally a skin suit for these other beings to dwell in. And so those beings have this absolute curse like of insanity. They're going to literally fight against the Most High. Where do these revelation armies come from? 
beast army come from that raises up its weapon to try to kill the son of Elohim when he comes? Like they believe they're going to win the war. They really believe it because they're beguiled by the same serpent that beguiled our ancestors before us. Like they are given over to a false reality. And as long as they have that, they will continue to do the evil on this earth. Mm. That clears that up. Um, let me do something on the technical side real quick. Okay. So that, that offers some light onto the situation, the searing of a conscience, um, and the insanity of a perverse reality, a reality that is not truth, that is devoid of all truth, that would be the only way that a conscious, intelligent being would be able to not have any thoughts of clarity or strategy concerning their own, their own situation. Because... Yeah, that's that's it. I mean, that's the only thing that it ever could be. Hmm. Um, another question is on page 142 of your book. It says, um, let me just flip to it right now. There's so many underlines, dude. I mean, I have marked your book up. So on 142, it says the... Um, is it 142? Yeah, it says 142. Okay. But more than all these, know this, you are needed. You are not born for death. For the Johns who pay you in white powder, um, A-chrome, talking in code here, corporate contracts, king's ransoms, or $5 bills. You were born with a greater purpose than you can imagine. The shackles on your wrists are not to keep you bound on their tables, beds, and chairs. They exist because you were made to set people free. What is, what is a John's and what is the significance of $5 bill? A John is a pimp. A John is a, is a, is a guy who pays for sex and, or the one who's receiving the money from the people who are paying to have sex with you, rape you, sodomize you, abuse you. The currency of this entire kingdom is the worst kind of abuse. It's the worst kind of addiction where people devour and consume each other for money, for, for nothing. A $5 bill is the price a lot of people pay to these whores, to these victims to these people that are so devastated and so hungry, so desperate to fill that hole of hope that was crushed and destroyed, that they're willing to give their bodies over, that they're, they're, they're beguiled to do it. Like I, I got, when I started coming out of this, like I became a different human entire, I became a completely different person. My wife married this super happy, like upbeat Christian guy who was, Speaking at, uh, on, they gave me the stage at church, fastest growing college ministry in the country, like Flatirons Community Church. Like they're like, come on stage, Nathan, do what you do, do the Nate show, do the Nate show. People just they're gonna come and watch, you know. Like the Father's given me a talent for speaking and for communicating with people, and and I could use that to build an empire, you know. And people all my life have been predating on me and trying to pull me into whatever version of it that they want. They're like, when you talk, people will do stuff. And, you know, they would persuade me into becoming this version of whatever churchianity model that I was with at that current time. And like when I, when I was in that, I was, I was happy. I was happy, but I was Inside, I knew that there was that that other war that I'd I'd left. I'd left all the victims. I'd left all the I'd left all the survivors. I'd abandoned them. I'd abandoned them in their places of misery, like their places of poverty and and 
destruction, like in the self hate, I'd, I'd left them to try to go have a happy life. I wanted the whole like American dream. Like I'll go to college, I'll get a good degree. Like I'll marry this woman. We're going to have this beautiful little life together. We'll move into her house. We're going to like, we're going to do ministry together. It'll be so great. We're going to be at this super church, this mega church. They're going to make me a pastor here and we're going to have this great life together. And I was like, behind the scenes, I saw these same filth and like, I've, I became a totally different person and I went back to the old ways because I saw the same compromise there. I saw the same cowardice there. I saw, I saw people that were willing to, to water down their message of truth for the sake of drawing in the crowd over and over and over again, that they were like, don't talk about all this dark stuff. And I just hate it when people tell me, don't speak the truth. I, I hate that. I hate it when people tell me, shut your mouth. Don't talk about that stuff over don't talk about it anymore because you know what they silenced me for so long gagged me and taped me up and bound me up and tied me to hotel tables and tied me to bedposts and they forced me to be their slave and i i i begged the father give me a chance to get out and if you give me a chance to get out i will never stop I will never quit. And you know what? I compromised. I compromised because I just wanted, I wanted what they'd offered me. That there's this, this happy life you can have out there that you can just have your cake and eat it too. That you can be happy and make money and live this life and never look at that dark stuff again. But you know what? When I would go out on the streets, I can see everything that everybody else overlooks. I see the grungy, grimy, filthy stuff. I can smell where people are having sex. I can smell where people are being raped. I can smell where there's politicians and police who are practicing this entire network. I can feel it and smell it and find it everywhere I go. All my life, I've been able to know where the darkness is, know where the evil is, know where that ancient evil is hiding. And you know what? I went back to the streets. I started going out between 11 o'clock at night and four in the morning in Boulder, Colorado, and I began terrain mapping. I began finding and marking targets. I began analyzing where all of the pimps were. That's those Johns who are calling the shots, who got 12-year-old girls out there getting in limousines with the wealthy guys in the club. Like I began to build my list like I've always done before. And I was wrestling with that dilemma of like, do I wield the word or do I wield the weapon? You know, like I want, I wanted to just start working again. And I was wrestling with that so hard because I had this woman at home. I had a wife. I had a name. I had like an address. I had all this stuff that I didn't have before. Like I had an identity that I couldn't just burn and go back to one of the aliases I've ever operated under. Like I had this relationship that was covenantal. Like I really meant the words I said to my wife, even though the woman I was married to was a stranger to me. I knew that the relationship I had from her was authentic, even if I didn't feel it, even if I didn't want her love, I wanted to fight and, and I walked through those streets and I began to pray with those people. I began to intercede for those people. I began to see those miracles you read about in the Bible where demons come out of people and they came out of the pimps as much as they came out of the prostitutes. I began to see that the spiritual darkness, the spiritual violence that is taking place is affecting the murderers and the monsters, the victims and the perpetrators all the same. And you know what? As easy as it is to kill a human being and to drain the life from them and to watch it spill out of them and finally feel like the victim's going to be free, I found that there were so many other people that rose up and took their place so quickly. And I was like, well, I'm going to need an army to slaughter everyone. We're going to have to just get better weaponry to start killing more people faster. And I realized at the end of the day, I couldn't kill death. Like I couldn't kill him. I couldn't kill him. He would always have somebody else who was willing to pop up in his place. I was fighting Agent Smith who could just drop himself into another skin suit and keep going and replicate himself. And every time I cut him down, there was more. But then when I started cutting people down with the word that came out of my mouth, I began to see deliverance was the end game. Deliverance was the goal. Because if you can convince one of these people to set down that former lifestyle, that they are worth more than any $5 bill that some guy handed them in a bathroom, that their purpose was for so much more from that than the needle that they put in their arm and that bit of relief that they were getting from that liquid fire. 
that there was something that the father could give to them that no man, no woman on this earth could, no king, no queen, no nobody on the earth that's had all the power in the world has ever come close to comprehending the heights and the depths and the breadths of the love that the father has for us through his son and the power that can set us free from that level of depravity. And you know what? I began to get hungry for, for true deliverance for the people around me. And it changed me completely. I saw that this war really is not won through weapons of war, the carnal weapons that I used to use. This battle is in the spirit. This battle is in the minds. This battle is in these information wars that this is a far more effective weapon than these little other tools that we use to try to cut each other down. Hmm. That is another truth that is very uh, ambiguous. It's it's a it's another multi-dimensional truth. And what that truth just did for me here in that is it it shed light on basically what the definition of a perspective is. Because when you look at what you just said, that it proves that God's word is the truest truth of truths. It is it is what it is. And um, when you, when you think about like offing somebody because they're bad, they're, they're a pimp or there's someone that is, you know, operating in the kingdom of darkness in any which manner of severity, your righteous anger in, in your frustration and everything in you as a man wants to do something boom right there like it's god who is the judge because he's the only one that is qualified to judge and if we were to judge it would hurt us because now we're put on the hook because however much we judge we get judged back and even more so than that like even if you did accomplish let's say killing a pimp that pimp, that dude was literally just a human being, a soul, a spirit that was deceived and fell for the lie, fell for the temptation, fell for the deception and was a conduit, a vehicle for the actual enemy, which is the demon, the spirit, the lie itself. And you're right. You cannot, we cannot kill that other than with the word of God, with the word of truth. Truth is the only thing that can kill a lie. And that's all we're even doing is fighting a bunch of lies wearing people suits. Hmm. And like, you don't get that truth on the surface level. When you're just talking, oh, hey, how, how's the kids? Oh, Nathan, you, know, you went out and, you know, processed some sheep up on the mountain. Like when, when, when you're just talking like that, your brain isn't even capable of perceiving truth at that level. Like to get to this truth, it takes work. It takes getting yourself to a level to where you're analyzing in a perspective of multi dimensions, where you understand that this war is not against flesh and blood. It's against principalities and rulers and authorities in places that we cannot grab out and touch. It's just a different, it's a different reality. It doesn't just because it's not tangible. It doesn't make it any less real, hmm. but the fact that you cannot touch it makes it even so much more real. And that, that is so good because people need to know that if you really want to fight, if you really want to do something against what's going on, if you really want to make a difference, like you got to be the change that you want to see starting with the man in the mirror. And then after that, you have to understand that your weapons are useless if they are not founded in the sword of the spirit, which is God's word. And even me, even on this podcast, like even throughout days in my life, you know, like, I'm like, Oh, should I keep the gun by my bed? You know, blah, 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 blah. Like, what should I do? I should get some, you know, 40 acres and build a long driveway. Like everybody does, like everybody yeah. does. And yeah. it takes work to get to that place where you're like, you know what? I need to be more mature than this. I need to stop being spiritual milk and I need to be more meat and potatoes about this because if I'm not, I'm going to get took, I'm going to get yeah. taken for a ride. And um, I think that your testimony and specifically, Nathan, it offers so much clarity to all the questions that people um, in the churchianity realm 
that are slowly starting to evolve and become awakened to the remnant, which is the true believers and the walkers of the way. Those are the questions that those people are wrestling with. Those are the yeah. realities in, in the truth dimensions that they're not scratching the itch or being educated on up on the sermons of the cool churches. And man, that is such a powerful truth because it defeats the kingdom of darkness like that. Yes. It doesn't, you don't need a tool. You don't need a piece of metal. You don't need not nothing. You just need the stories of our ancestors like King David and Caleb and uh, Joshua. And you need the sharpest sword that will ever will exist for eternity. And I'm so encouraged by you, man. Bro, there is, there is a, but it's, this is why we like you go back to the Hebrews chapter 11, man, this cloud of witnesses. It says we've because of all like he goes through telling you all these awesome, like fiery, salty stories. And then he's like, because we have this great cloud of witnesses, let us cast off every hindrance, like cast off these nets that have been over us. These like sins that have so easily entangled us, like cast them off. And it's like, I was encumbered by the desire to, to be vengeance. And at the same time, like we're commanded to judge righteously within the brotherhood and sisterhood of the body. Like we're commanded to judge righteously among each other. And we have to become shepherds. Like we have to become shepherds. Like the father literally took me to become a shepherd. I was reading through in that becoming Gibberim series. Like I literally got to the story in David's life when he ran to the crags and the rocks like the hills and where there was goats. Like I literally parked onto this property in Asheville, North Carolina and became a goat shepherd as I got to that part in the story with David and was like, what are you doing? Like, what are you doing with me? This is a setup. Like you're about to teach me something that I can't learn anywhere else ever. And I couldn't learn those lessons until I lived them. Like, why did he take Moses who just murdered a guy? Like Moses does a witness check. Like, he does a look left, a little look right. You know, he's all like, boom, kills the guy, kills the guy, buries him in the sand, like kills him. Thinking to himself that Yah was going to raise him up, that the, that the people would look at Moses and go, oh, you're the next judge. Like, this is how the judges used to do it, right? Like Ehud goes out and kills one guy, the king of Moab, blows a shofar, and they slaughter the entire kingdom that was reigning against him like moses has biblical examples for where the father has has poured out his spirit on people and they've killed people and th overthrown the kingdom of darkness and overthrown the radical intelligent evil that was consuming them like it's not that moses was it said moses was trained up and raised and raised in all the wisdom of mitzrayim like he knew all of the power the dark occult power he knew all the book of the dead the book of raw like he knew all the dark occult workings. He knew what the doctrines of Balaam were because Balaam was literally in the courtroom, in, in Pharaoh's house. He knew all of the worst level of, of like darkness. And yet he was also simultaneously being raised up in the, the stories and the testimonies of his ancestors. He learned the stories of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Like these testimonies, you guys. These testimonies are the transformation of men, of children into men, of, of little girls to become women. They, they change you. And like I read a book called God Smuggler at the time, God Smuggler. And it was so full of these stories of people that were trying to bring the scriptures into places where it was absolutely an executable offense, jailable offense to bring this word in. Like there was a lot of places all over the world, y'all, where it's executable to have one page of the book that we all have in excess and abundance lying around everywhere. Like I love those stories because I love seeing believers become criminals in kingdoms of corruption. I love it because I've seen what happens when men and women are tested. It flushes out all the cowards. Like I love it when I get to see an entire assembly scattered to the wind and only a handful stay. Like I love it because you find out who are the remnant. Like when you light a forest on fire, when you light a forest on fire, you're going to find out where every wolf is, where every serpent is, and where every sheep is. And then you're going to see at the end of it all, 
that there's a couple of shepherds still abiding. Like there are true men of righteousness, zealous convictions. And Moses was taken from the path of a murderer to the path of a shepherd. He had to learn to go physically be a shepherd of animals to learn how to be able to watch over these people that he was going to get entrusted with. And it was the most critical skills and lessons I've ever learned in my life. And we need to have men and women who rise up. We need men who are shepherds who utterly detest deception hate it and utterly destroy it when it's in our midst like yahuwah like everyone says the likes to quote this verse at me they're like yeah vengeance is mine says yahuwah and i'm like yeah how did yah execute vengeance on the earth he raised up adversaries when date when solomon went astray and started burning his children alive in the fire when he started worshiping all these other mighty ones and having sex with so many other women and giving his heart to these other women's mighty ones it said yahuwah raised up adversaries for him and like the father raises up human beings like nebuchadnezzar he literally says you were an axe in my hand like the king of assyria he's like you are the one who is going to come execute my vengeance and my wrath but don't you ever think that i don't come for you next like he will absolutely use men and women on this earth to execute vengeance and destruction of wickedness in very pure and powerful ways. And we need men and women of that same conviction. I read another book after I was in this greenhouse down in Florida and I was working in pruning tomato vines. I spent a lot of time behind the vines. I was like, he's going to make me a vine dresser. I got to learn all the stories about vine dressers. And I'm in there with this guy who was literally a missionary in Kenya for so many years. And he's like, he's just married this woman from Tanzania who was a, a she was a, her parents were American and moved there to Tanzania. She was born in Tanzania and uh, off Lake Victoria there. And they had an orphanage that she grew up on. She's like an African, but she's like in camouflage in, in American form, you know? And they met at this place called Echo, which is like a missionary training school down in Florida. And they literally train train people with the actual skills, like agricultural skills that you need to be able to feed the people that you're like, here, read the Bible. It's going to set you free. And they're all starving to death. And they're like, well, I better learn some kind of farming methods to help you. Here's some Monsatan corn for you. Like plant this corn. It'll save you. Here's some glyph. Like they just, we're just exporting death. And they're like, you can read the Bible and it's good for you, but our poison is better. You know, like, oh, it's just these dilemmas. Come on, bro. There's the cure right there. You see that microgreens, the millennial miracle. That's what I read today, by the way, y'all. Salt and light. What a powerful book. This is why farmers are going to change the world, man. I read the parable of the sower. You never stop sowing the seeds, y'all. Like, but I, this book, he, he was talking to me and he asked me a question. He's like, do you think I should take out life insurance? This was his question to me because he said, I want to go to Somalia and preach the gospel. And I was like, okay. And he's like, there's seven Christians in Somalia. I'm like, seven <laughs> Christians? He's like, seven. Like they have teams of people who infiltrate Somalia to try to bring the word in there. And they have entire hunter killer teams who all they do is hunt down and murder, not the Christians who come in, but their converts. And they, because they mm. learned something because they started killing the believers when they would come in to try to bring the message, they started killing them. And what happened is they would make a martyr out of them. Right. And then there'd be like seven more, 10 more would come back in their place. And they were like, mm, let's just kill everyone. They convert. And so that's what they do. That's how they handle business in Somalia, y'all. Somalia has the biggest coastline in all of Africa. It's unbelievable, the resources and the potential that's there, but it's been raped and plummaged. And all the spiritual working that's in, in Somalia is unbelievable. But he was like asking me this because he literally is, is getting married. He just got married, met this woman at Echo. They get married and they're like on this farm working with me and they're preparing to go back to this orphanage where they're going to live in Africa the rest of their life. And he's thinking about how do I can infiltrate and smuggle the word into Somalia and should I have life insurance? And I was like, no, I was like, there is no way you should be betting, gambling on your death, putting in investing, investing in your death, that the only way your wife gets it. I was like, this is blood money, dude. I was like, this is the only way you get paid is by your death. Like, this is the wrong kingdom. This is the wrong confidence. This is not the way it's supposed to be. We should have brothers and sisters that genuinely look after each other's needs so that if you die on the battlefield, I take care of and support your family. Like, I take care of you. I got your, that's what brothers do for each other. Literally in the scriptures, it's like, you're, if that woman didn't have a seed, it's like, you go raise up a seed for her so she has an inheritance. Like, you look after each other. I was like, this is how it's supposed to operate. And he's like, you know what? You should read this book called The Insanity of God. 
And it was all about these guys who go over there and travel all over the world, smuggling and bringing the word in. And there were so many miracles that took place that I wanted to see here in America. Like I was made to be a missionary here in this, this country, but over there, people, that spiritual veil is so much more lifted. And the miracles that were happening, I was reading about, I was like, this sounds like the Bible I read. Like, I want this. I want to see this. And if we lay down the carnal weapons and we really put our faith and trust in him and we eagerly contend in and weigh into the fray and fight in that kingdom of darkness, he backs us up. He protects us. He makes people invisible. He hides, like there's stories in there that are just so beautiful because he's concealing people that are doing his will from a whole entire surveillance network, the best surveillance networks anywhere. He's hiding them and shielding them and allowing his message to go forth in such powerful and supernatural ways. And it just, it made me so filled with belief that, you know what? I can trust him. And it, it just gave me this weight off my shoulders. Like I don't need the 40 acres with the long gate driveway with all kinds of, of traps and sensors and thermal weapons and optics. And like, I did all that down in Texas. Like I was a farm manager and they're getting thermal optics and I was being able to glass out the neighbor. Like we could oversee the highway. And I had an optic, I had a spot where I could be able to shoot any vehicle that was out there. Like I was getting back into that mindset because I'm like, I got to protect my, my, my house and I got to protect the, the farmers that when he's out of town and like, I just realized at the end of the day, man, if they send, they could send the nations after you. And if like they sent all these people to bring Elisha down and he was like, if I'm not a man of Elohim, let fire come down from the heaven and consume you. Like Samuel, like King Saul went after sent assassins after Samuel and David, and they were running around naked and prophesying every time they showed up. They're all like rolling and doing the Holy Rollers, freaky Pentecostal stuff. Like, like that's how the father protected Samuel. Samuel, the only time he ever had to raise up a sword was to hew Agag in pieces. Like he never had to fight to protect his life. The father always protected him in unique and powerful ways. Yeah, man. It's uh it's a crossroads for every man who is raised in this day and age to live with their eyes and conjure solutions to problems with fleshly means. And um, if anything, I think this podcast is going to shed a lot of light to a lot of people that if you can just... If you can just think spiritually, if you can just change your perspective, it's going to do so much for your peace of mind. And um, I have a whole bunch more questions, but really, I just kind of wanted to make this a little bit more personal. And I just wanted to tell you, Nathan, that I talk to a lot of people. I, I really like broadcast a certain and a, a specific message. Um, each and every day I make three, three videos and I, I throw those videos out to Facebook and Instagram and TikTok and I'm working on my YouTube channel. And I try to tell people over and over and over again that the, the system that we live in is stacked. It's a house of cards mm -hmm. and the three letter agencies that are responsible for regulating all of our food, all of our media our news, our water, the air we breathe, like the concentrations of chemicals, like it's just a perfect balance of how to kill people slowly or how to get people in a state where those same people that are trusted to regulate us can make the most profit on us through the most extended amount of time, aka mm -hmm. disease. Yeah. And so many people don't even understand that. And that's like the very top of the puzzle for me, I feel like. And like the very mm -hmm. bottom of the basement is your realm in your experience, in your life. And I feel like what's happening is, I don't even want to use a pyramid as, as a reference, like a skyscraper. Like, I feel like I'm at the top of this skyscraper, like getting people to just look beneath the surface a little bit, like of what they're putting in their mouth what yeah. they are actually eating and exposing themselves to. And like the, the agriculture, like the most fundamental things as human beings, which is food, water, and oxygen. And then like at the very bottom, like the roots of this systemic corruption in this radically intelligent evil is the cauldron that you crawled out of. And Somewhere between our relationship and 
You guys can go ahead and comment down below right now. If you've made it this far, thank you so much. Subscribe, like, go follow Nathan as well on his uh, Snatched from the Flames YouTube channel. Just comment the word want more. And we'll know that we're going to spend more episodes of podcasts bridging the gap and eventually mm -hmm. coming to a, a point of a message that is easily digestible that covers the spectrum. And I think that's what's happening right now, Nathan. I think with all of my prayer time and with all of the things that I've been reading in scripture and all the stuff that I'm kind of, you know, witnessing the sign of the times around me, I think that the age of information, I think that the the kingdom of darkness is revealing itself and coming out of secrecy in direct mm -hmm. uh, attempts to nullify or to fight against the Lord, Yahweh, Yeshua Messiah, and his kingdom coming soon and showing up with absolute undeniability. And I think what's happening is people like you, people like me, people like the ones that are starting to real just be brand new, woken up and awakened. I think that that is what's comprising the remnant. I think that is what is popping people out of this system. Like I have a whole entire side of my family that are vaccinated and like just look at people that aren't like they're absolutely menaces or whatever the case may be. Like the, the moral of the story is they're just hook, line and sinker living life, you know, eating every word off of the news channel. And then there's the a completely different side of my family on the other side where everyone knows what's going on and they just feel like they're living in an alternative universe because there we, we we're living in a world where everyone is just stuck in their, their life shell and they're so veiled. There's so much scale buildup on their eye gates. Their eyes to see are just eons away their ears to hear and people like us nathan are the ones to like just hit them with something like this boom there goes there goes that scale like mm -hmm. introduction to holy spirit welcome to your new life you know look at what's going on around you and that's what needs to happen and you're absolutely right the microphone is the way to do that right now the remnant mm -hmm. is waking up People are starting to use TikTok and watching the world catch on fire and get hit with hurricanes and earthquakes and all sorts of stuff. It is a madness. It's a soup of madness out there right now. Like, I don't even know myself. Like, the truth is all I can cling to every day because, like, the news ain't telling the truth. But then TikTok's got all these things happening across the world. And, like, CERN's fired up. And, dude, I learned today what is founded on Geneva, Switzerland, and on the CERN campus, and it is like Apollo. The, yeah, dude, it's like the the um, World Economic Forum is there, the uh, LGBTQ Headquarter Foundation, you know, thing is there, the uh, like so many different institutions in shot callers, the World Religious Forum, the Financial um, Forum, like all of these massive world controlling headquarter bases are right there because hmm. there's a the veil is thin there but there, there was there was something you said that just like what got my wife and i out of here was our stomachs like what what got us out of here was not being able to think was brain dead was brain fog was indigestion was like celiacs and gluten intolerance and feeling like crap all the time that 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 literally is where it started was drinking water just drink that like just water you talked about those three things there's something called a hierarchy of needs right like food water oxygen shelter basic right basic you can't you can't when people are in that survival state that's it their whole life revolves around just a basic couple of those things like you can't go 3 minutes without like, okay, there's this in survival training. It's like, you can't go three days without water. You can't go three weeks without food. You can't go three minutes without oxygen. 
and you can't go three seconds without hope. Like there is a true hierarchy of needs for the human, for, for mankind. There was a hierarchy of needs. And I was like, I was doing wilderness therapy for the first time up at a, a lake in Colorado. And I was up in a, in a technology free campus and people were paying tens of thousands of dollars a month to send their really rich kids, children, 17, 18 year olds to like 26 year olds with what they call failure to launch, which they're like, yeah, you know, my son has $250 million waiting in a trust fund. He, uh, he won't go get a job. And I'm like, they're like, can you just make him a man? He just wants to play video games and do Coke all the time. Like, can you, can you make him like a, a capable person? And I'm like, you can't, it was just, it was insane. It was insane. I'm trying to, we're trying to make men out of boys. And boys that are like destined to be boys the rest of their life. It's the artificial extension of adolescence. It's like you have socially engineered a society of stupid, you know, like, and I was walking around this, this, this lake up there, Gold Lake, which is like the largest natural lake in Boulder County. And I was praying, just asking the father to help me because I was, I was coming undone y'all. I was coming undone in a real bad way. I stopped having technology up there and it was so quiet and there's bald eagles like hunting on this lake. It was like the most picturesque, beautiful place. I started like being in and around an environment where it was so quiet like we are nine, almost 9,000 feet at the base of the Rocky Mountains, like just this incredible place. And I was just begging the father to heal me, like begging him, help me. Cause I was coming undone. Like all of the memories, all of the past, all of the nightmares, like everything was coming to a head. And I was wrestling with like, how do I tell my wife? How do I tell my wife? She's going to leave me. She's going to leave me. Like everyone else is going to leave me. Like I was just so conditioned that I was going to lose everything. If I talked about this and like, I was like, help me. And he was like, I was walking around the lake and he said, come and drink. And I literally heard a rock crack open and water flowing. And I walk down this hillside and there is a spring that is starting right there. And I used to call it Jesus spring because I went there and I chunked water from there. I just drank this water that was coming out of there, this little seeping spring in the hillside. And I just began to drink that water. And then I started bringing my water jug. I was like, filling up there and I was going back to the, to work my shift. And every day I was doing that. And I was just like, in a matter of a few days, like I felt like my brain turned on. I felt so much clearer. I felt like, ah, oh, I could think again. And so then I started filling up five gallon jugs of water and taking it home to Chelsea. And I was like, we were drinking spring water every day. And I was like, in a matter of a week or two, like this just calcification that had taken place on my pineal gland, all of like all of these toxins started leaching out of us. Like we could think again. And then we started being like, well, if this is just the water. Then we started researching the water. Then we started researching the food. Then we started examining like what's going into our bodies. Then we started examining like what are the different diets we see in the scriptures? What are different ways that we can like eat our way back to health? And like we started juicing, we started taking supplementation. And we were like, we started feeling like electrified and energized. And we were like, we had all this energy and we had all this fight in us again. And we were like, this is the best thing that's ever happened to us. That was the catalyst for all of the change, all of the transformation, all of the deliverance was from bread and water, was from food and clothing and water and air because I got hope again. When I drank that water, I finally had hope again. And I'm like, I, this is why I became so passionate about a call back to the ancient paths that like we can literally cure these people with something so simple. And I was trying to find for four and a half years we traveled around in an rv we sold our home and we went on a quest to try to discover what our purpose was because we knew this whole homesteading survival dream if we wanted to just i wanted to just run away to the mountains y'all and just dig into the hillside and buy an old mine abandoned mine and just go back into the underground where i came from and just prepare for war you know i was like let's go baby and she's like yes and then later on the father just kept forcing us to stay and stay and we were in an environment that was just a hell hole and the worst kind like people were killing children butchering children like jessica Ridgeway in our neighborhood. It was just like, it was a nightmare. It was a literal living nightmare. And we were like, how do we get out? And he was like, stay. And he like, he showed us there, like, you're not going to, you're not going to die unless I say so. And it was like, but when he finally went on the road, we started going to these farms and started doing what was called WOOF, W W O O F world. It was like the worldwide organization of organic farms. And you could trade your labor for a place to stay and food and, and a skill set. And we were like, we started learning how to live, like live, like as, as people, like they used to for a long time, like to grow our own food. Like I got to learn that the cure, the, like the main weapon of a man's warfare is the sweat of his brow. Like, like there, there you, it said in, in Genesis three that the, like when Adam was like getting the, the curse put on him, right? He's like, by the sweat of your face, you will eat bread. And I have a video where I was, I talked a lot more about farming for a lot of years, y'all. 
And I had a video called by the sweat of your face because I started doing all this farming. It was just ripping sweat constantly. And then I was like, you know, learning all about soil health and trying to be like, what is all the amendments we're supposed to make to the soil? How do we get the soil to produce the most nutrient dense, biologically powerful food that we could ever eat? And I was like, I was all into regenerative agriculture and Mark Shepard. And I was like, we well, got to get back to the ancient past. And, and then I started studying what's in sweat. I was like, I bet you that our soils are deficient in sweat. Just period. Since the tractor showed up. I'm like, horses used to pee in the fields. Oxen used to pee and poop in the field. Like, there's all this nutrients that's no longer in our fields because we've abdicated our, our labors. We've looked for a more convenient method of farming and totally lost our identity in it. We've literally given away what was required. He said, by the sweat of your face, you will eat bread. When you sweat into the earth, and the earth yields its fruit to you. You eat the bread of satisfaction. And you said it so perfectly in your book. When I was reading it today, I was just like, this is why people need to eat life. And when you have an intimate relationship, where we, whether it's from the pasture to the plate, or whether it's from those little seed trays that you see behind this man right here, those things are so unbelievably invigorating because you can go from soil and seed and in seven days you can reap a harvest that's not fested with pests that's not unbelievably devoured by predators and prey all over that you can have in a few days the most nutrient dense 260 times more nutrient dense than the broccoli the kale the brassica the carrots like those little tiny little green plants you're looking at, you're like, wow, they're so cute. That thing wants to grow vines. You see that thing? It's putting out all those little growths off the side of it. That thing wants to reach around and spread its those little tendrils all over the earth. Those little roots right there, that thing is a powerhouse of life waiting to invigorate you with everything you need to live. That's why he said, I give you every green herb of the, of the field. That's literally your medicine, y'all. And if you go back to these simple ways of living, it changes you completely. I was trying to build out this farm with $10,000 a month budget, right? Trying to build out this super farm of, of chickens and turkeys and pasture raised and rotated. I'm all like, I am the champion of Greg Judy and, and of uh, all these like, these are like the heroes of the modern farming world to me. They're in like the, the hall book of faith. But I was like trying to do all that stuff. And at the end of it, I found microgreens. I was like, <laughs> because we were losing sheep to dogs. We were losing, I was losing chickens to stinking owls and raccoons and opossums. I was like, I can't stay up all night and shoot every predator that's killing my perfect pasture raised chickens. I'm like, surely Joe Salatine had animals get killed, you know? Like, why am I losing 20% of all of my beautiful raised crop? What the heck am I doing with my life? I was literally running back to the bottle. I was just becoming a drunk because I was so depressed. I was like, I've got a donkey that's stomping the head into the lambs. And I was just wanting to kill that donkey every day of my life. I was like, I have never wanted to kill an animal so badly. I would just sharpen my knives and stare at her throat. And I was like, someday I'm going to kill you. Oh it was God. like, I just plotting my revenge. And I got it, man, with a 300 blackout in three rounds and then a knife. Oh, man. Yeah. But then I got it. This dude, that donkey just. Anyways, I'm not going to go there because there's a lot, a lot of bloodshed. That was the only time I picked up a sword and just that donkey was killing my sheep. You know what I mean? Like I'm a shepherd, y'all. And when the thing that's supposed to be your guard dog is doing problems, man, you kill it with violence. And I did. And I was sitting there at the end of it, man. And I took this course on growing microgreens and was like, you got to be kidding me. I'm like wasting my life out here trying to plant asparagus in the worst soils ever. Like we got soil tests. We got these, like we got, we paid $500 for this guy to come out and do this soil composition test with us. And I'm like, finally, I'm going to find out the fertility of my fields. Right. I'm all like, I've been getting my sheep to rotate through here. It's going to be amazing. And he basically found out. He's like, Oh, by the way, it's the water. If you water your crops, they're going to lock up calcium. They're going to lock up all of these nutrients. And every time you water them, you're going to kill them. And I was like, what the heck? Mm. I live in central Texas. It hasn't rained in six months. And he's like, if you water them, he's like, you're literally going to lock up their ability to grow. And I was like, this is the worst. He's like, we're going to put an entire vinegar drip system on your well. So that every time you water, we're going to acidify it in a different way. And I was like, this is madness. I was like, this is madness. We're going to drop two, $300,000 on this thing so that maybe I'll start to turn a profit in two and a half years. I was like, this is nuts. I'm working 20 hours a day, six days a week. Like, I'm losing the war here. This is insanity. And then I literally, this tiny little tray of microgreens shows up. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me. I can put this in a closet with some lights, not even like super high tech, fancy grow light lights. I could put this in with little fluorescent bulbs and I can grow the best food ever. I'm like, this is stupid. I am, I am doing dumb things now. Because with a tiny little thing, you see that setup behind him? He's going to make more money off those little trays than I could have made off of all the asparagus that I planted and waited months and years to harvest. 
It's unbelievable the nutrient density that's waiting for you out there. And it's true. You can literally give somebody a single meal and change their life forever because they'll finally be able to think clearly. Like it is the weapons in our warfare and it comes from food and water and clothing and words. Yeah, that's beautiful. And the beautiful thing about it is when I wrote this book, I didn't even really know all the way what I was trying to say, what I was saying. You know, I, I wasn't a dude that did it for years and years and years. But it's funny how the father places certain truths that just like come alive. They unfold and they bloom with with certain years or experiences. And half of what you just said about your um, experiences with farming and just knowing that that was like the the butt of the joke, like you toiled all that, all that much and you discovered microgreens and how I speak about microgreens and the fire I put under people, you know, about microgreens. I always tell them it comes in three tiers. So the first tier is about putting more money in your pocket because everybody needs a little bit more money in their pocket for whatever they're going through right now. And um, if you're able to turn a side hustle into a small business, and then you're able to turn that small business into something that provides for your family in an honest way, everyone would be willing to join on that train and uh, see where it takes them. And then the second thing is just the pure nutrition, like the fact that it is more nutrient dense, the fact that it is the adolescent version of a fully grown vegetable and it has all of these trace minerals and vitamins. And the fact that it is delivered with more flavor, more color, more texture than people are even used to getting anyways with what's available with the romaine lettuce and the, uh, you know, the iceberg lettuce when it's not being recalled for having fecal matter in it. And then the third thing is the self-sufficiency, the ability to know how a seed gets its taproot out, starts drinking soil up, and then studying how, you know, when it verifies that there is consumable life contents in that substrate, that it sets off the genetic sequence and coding for that cotyledon leaf, which is the very first leaf that comes out of a seed, which a lot of people call microgreens. And then that cotyledon sends back information to that same genetic center that the Lord God Almighty source code into his creation and says, okay, now we're going to start doing the thing where we eat the light and that photosynthesis produces chlorophyll and ATP and then starts like communicating with the soil and the, in the microbes. And it's just like a, a three wheel axis that ends up, you know, like you said, eating oxygen or eating carbon dioxide, which is human exhaust, and then breathing oxygen, which is what we breathe, and also amending the soil. And also like through Paul Stamets' work of his uh, like mycocilium, he calls it, of where root systems talk to other root systems and they send electrical like signals and they communicate through the ground. And like, it's just this interconnected kingdom of like microbes and how basically soil works and how the creator designed a self working alive mechanism to turn what's underneath of the ground into a resource that what is being sown into the ground so that it's cyclical and systematic and unlimited. That's like a miracle. But even if you don't go that deep and you just understand how to not go to the grocery store and spend money on poison and teach your family what it means to feel a little bit more intimate with the food that you eat, like that's the third thing. And when you combine all of those things into such a little plant, mm -hmm. such a little modality of nutrition, such a easy seven day investment, like you, you put the seed in the ground. And you put it in germination station for a little bit, like literally a day or two, and then you black it out, which is like just stretching that plant so it tries harder, it grows stronger and faster, and then you finally give it what it wants. You you give it some light, 
and it freaks out. It starts doing what it was destined to do and it grows and it becomes something that your body can use to operate optimally on the source code that our creator designed. Like we're supposed to eat this stuff. We're supposed to have all of these trace minerals. We're supposed to have all these vitamins. We're supposed to be cellularly hydrated. We're supposed to eat like the, like you have educated people, which is super valuable. Like the endosperm, the bran, the, um, the wheat and the chaff, you know, like all of that stuff. It's so interesting. And we've been stripped of it. And it literally, Nathan, like maybe you can talk about this for a second, but I just feel sometimes like nothing is real. I feel like everything is a setup. I feel like everything's all smoke and mirrors and cloaks and daggers. I feel like the only real thing that we have as people right now is the word of God and what your eyes can see. But even that is getting hijacked with like this project blue beam and artificial mm-hmm. intelligence and, you know, all, all of these fake clouds and cloud seeding and chemtrails, like mm-hmm. literally it's so hard in this day and age to know what's real and know what's stacked up against you, what's weaponized against you. It's the food. It's the news. It's what your eye gates can't perceive unless you're like literally spiritually under the influence of the Holy spirit to be able to discern every one and zero in the matrix. Like it's so overwhelming sometimes. Bro. I love that you asked that question. Even as you describe it, like there is this, beautiful thing when you realize it's total war okay when you realize you are you are actually in the fight for your life you you have to absolutely get to a place like where the hook in the jaw of your like so many people are just trapped in the the monday through friday monotony of life just chasing the next like living for the weekend you know like just their whole life is caught up in a different paradigm. But then all of a sudden, something so disruptive, paradigm shifting comes along and just rips them out of that. And they're suddenly looking at the world like, what just happened? You know, what the heck is going on out here? They see the the, the wizards behind the curtain and they're like, <sighs> and then they dive into the rabbit hole of what is who, what, where, when, why, how, like, they start uncovering all the entirety of the evil agendas that are taking place everywhere. And it says as knowledge increases, so too does sorrow. And I feel for you, bro. you got that sorrow on you right now. I understand, but you're immersed in something that is giving you a false identity about reality. And the truth is you of anybody should be looking at the little things in life and remembering the awesome omniscience that is designed into every single little seed you just described. You can see in that tiny little seed, absolute potential, absolute life in this abs in this otherwise un irrelevant tiny little speck of dust in the scheme of all of these things you just described in the schemes of overwhelming odds you're talking about how the solution is something so infinitesimally small to be a period at the end of this sentence and that very single tiny seed can germinate and bring forth 30, 60, or 100-fold yield. Like when in the days of Joseph, y'all, the reason I just got obsessed with this was because it said in the scriptures, this line that never, ever, ever left me was after the end of all of Joseph's life. He's got seven, I believe it's 17 years. He is literally trapped in a system of slavery. Trapped. Like physically can't get out of it. And he is like innocent, pure innocent, like truly innocent for 17 years like falsely accused in prison, like oh, the unbelievable frustration. And he just like, but everywhere he went, it says he found favor. That word is called hen, het noon, and it's grace. Every time you find it in the scriptures, like the first time it shows up is not in the New Testament. It shows up way in the beginning. And like he says he found favor in the eyes of this person and this person, whether it was the whether it was Potiphar, whether it was the prison guard, whether it was Pharaoh, like the father gave him a different weapon to overcome it. It was the tiny little seed in all of the chaos all the time. And he had 
favor from Yah. And it birthed in him confidence. It grew in him faith that he kept entrusting himself to the Father. Because you know what? At the end of it all, when he finally had the opportunity to get vengeance on his brothers who betrayed him, like stripped him of his life, threw him into a pit, tra trafficked him. He was a victim of human trafficking, sold multiple times, right? Beaten, chastised, scourged. It said his brothers are standing there and he could destroy them. He has all the power in the world. And he said, what you intended for evil, Yahuwah intended for good and the saving of many lives. That is the good news of this whole story. I know I lost my camera. Just hang in there. That's the good news of this story is that though the adversary intends all of this for evil and the slaying of many lives, Yahuwah intends it for good and the saving of many of them. Because Joseph was there, because he was actually there and not somewhere else, you know, there was freedom. He saved the world with seeds. He saved the world with seeds, you guys. Like, it was so simple. It was hiding there this whole time. I've been looking for the cure. I've been looking for the deliverance. I've been looking for salvation. And it was found in the seeds. He stored grain. Like, he stored grain. And I just, it, I was so freed from that when I finally got that. I was like, oh, my gosh. I'm finally free, too. I'm finally free, too. Because if I store up grain, if I store up grain and if I unlock the secrets in grain, I know that we can have it. I know he'll set us free from this and I know we'll have hope. And he gave people grain. It said they still had food. It's not like even them in the famine, they had almonds and honey and dates and nuts, but they needed seeds to live. They knew they needed seeds to live. And when they fresh milled that flour, they had every vitamin and mineral and amino acid they really needed to live was locked up in the grain. And Joseph stored it up. It said when they planted one measure, it was like they were reaping 1,800 measures. So they stored it up beyond number, beyond counting. They had to build entire entire storage vaults beyond your wildest imagination because they knew in the seven years of famine it would eat it up and by him doing that he literally got all the wealth of egypt all the wealth of the world came to him he became the most powerful man in the world because he went in authority and he stored up seeds and it just transformed me my wife and i have a whole series called becoming a millenite that just because we saw this, we finally realized we're like, oh my gosh, it's something so simple that we can literally feed the world. So like my passion and my desire is to feed people living, like to feed people, clothe them and water them. And the, like, if we can give people those three fundamentals. So like we started the linen railroad where we were shipping natural fiber garments. We were shipping grain. We were shipping seeds. I began to smuggle seeds to people all over the country because echo at that farm, they took me into their seed vault and I got a seed for myself, like how they're smuggling seeds into all these places all over the world. And I was like, this is the greatest thing I've ever seen in my life and i want to be all about it all the time i love smugglers i love criminals that book the insanity of god said the best people for the kingdom were the criminals and i was like finally somebody says i matter and i have a purpose and i have a meaning and i was like i'm all in baby let's find a way to get this life to the people in the world and so we started sending out these packages to people all over being like, and we're getting confiscated in customs sometimes. I'll be honest. It doesn't always go well, but we're getting that stuff everywhere. Right. And I was finding my favorite seed varieties and heirloom varieties. And I'm like, we just got to get this to people so they can know that they can live and they can multiply. Like if they take this one packet of seeds and if they're good stewards with it, they can have food for the ages. And I'm just like, I've never been more invigorated in my life to see this come to pass. I'm going to change batteries. So you take it over. Seeds are amazing. They are little microcosms of conception and creation and life itself and death and the wheel within a wheel with what this life really is. And for a while there, my mom was actually starting to call me like the story of Joseph or, you know, the parable of Joseph. And I, for a little while, I felt like that too. Like I'm straight up packaging up seeds and, and shipping them out to strangers and the only way that they're doing that is that they believe my message enough to co-sign their pocketbooks with it. And it just blows my mind because the amount of people that started growing their own food indoors all year round from my content in my ministry, people that would never otherwise ever think about farming or gardening, you know, they, they took what I had to say. It, it it affected their heart to the point of action. And now my warehouse is full of so many varieties 
of these seeds that turn into food that power people's bodies, that there's no hazmat sprayer coming in with pesticides and insecticides and herbicides. It's just hand grown little tiny miniature versions of what we've been doing for ages and ages. It's how civilization became civilized. It's how, you know, we graduated from the agricultural revolution, which was the foundation of the industrial revolution. It's why you have a cell phone now. It's why you're able to communicate. It's just so special to me. And I'm thankful to Yahuwah for giving this to me as the foundation because from this foundation, I plan on building all sorts of infrastructures. Like I just thought brain before our podcast um, phase four, which is going to be after I get my homestead set up the way that I want it to after, you know, I get the land and I, and I build the home and I start the family and, you know, I take care of what's mine phase four. Like I'm not going to go out and buy a boat. I'm not going to go out and do something, you know, irresponsible whatever I want, basically, I want to go do it again. I want to go buy land again. I want to go build a home again. And I want to give it to people and like make these Airbnbs or something that people can sign up for and have on that like 10, 20, 30 acre property, whatever it is, like this building, this pole barn, this barn dominium where people can come in and like there's vertical gardening and farming in one end. And then there's a way for you to learn hydroponics and different substrates. Like if you want to do cocoa cooler, you want to do soil, you want to do um, water as a substrate, like go learn that. And then there's like the tower gardens where you're just, you know, basically learning how the vertical systems work. And then like outside, there's the traditional garden where you can go sow seeds and you can figure out how to use trellises. And like, then another one, there's like a shipping container, like automated high tech gardening system to where it's like a plug and play microgreens operation and people basically it's like a like a homestead homeschool where people like are just fed up with the education system they're not jabbing their children they're not getting indoctrinated that there's more than two genders they're they're just fed up with it they're not doing it they don't know how they're going to not be doing it because they literally are still like sucked into the world but all they know is they don't want to expose their kids to that no more and they don't have any more options and homeschooled people are weird and they don't want their kids to be weird. But what I'm going to do is make it cool again. And I'm going to send these people, give them an option to, you know, have community and fellowship and meet people and like break the barrier of like the social awkwardness. Now, if you can't pe look people in the eyes no more without feeling weird or you can't, you know, have any relative capacity to relate to somebody. And like, there's just a, there's, there's a difficulty to, communicate with people like all that just getting broken down just by throwing people into this situation teaching people how to cut wood teaching people how to you know do basic first aid you know doing the basic first foundations beginnings of foraging and being able to understand the tools that we were given on this earth as human beings and i think that would be so powerful because it's such a big wave of people that are waking up and realizing that they are not wanting to play by the system's rules anymore. And it is, it's a powerful tool. And I feel like I am in a very uh, peculiar or not peculiar, but like a specific situation. And I'm in a, I'm in a place where I can pull that off. Like I can do that. I can, I can make that happen for people. And I know that people will grab onto that and gravitate. And if they, don't, which they will, but even then, like just educating them on what it is, is going to cause interest and it's going to cause people to flock to that because that's exactly what happened with microgreens. I didn't even know what a microgreen was, dude. I had no idea. There was like two people in the internet that were doing it when I first started and I learned it. I learned it. I understood it. And then I started getting people to fall in love with it. And the same thing can happen with any good thing. Yes. And that's, that's the beauty of an idea. That's the beauty of somebody who has a passion and is willing to pursue it. The, the reason people are so drawn to that, Tyler, is that you have a desire that is so deeply rooted in you. That is that you can't, you can't, you can't take that out of you. It's, it's truly set itself deep. Like the scripture says he wants us to be like the oaks of righteousness and so I like was like, well, what the heck is that about, right? I grew up in an area where the biggest oak I saw was called a scrub oak, and it's basically a bush. 
And I was like, what the heck is the deal with the oaks? Why, why is this all about it? You know, and there's a, I started studying trees because they just lost. I just, I got lost in it. And this is the cover of this book. This is one of the best books I could ever recommend to y'all. This is called the, um, oh, sorry, hold on. The Medicinal Trees of the American South, an Herbalist Guide by Judson Carroll. And if you see on that, that's a picture of a tree. Okay, I got to get closer so you can really get an idea. It's a little too dark. Hold on. If you see that, that is a woman standing there. There's a person of the author probably right in front of that oak. That is, of course, a gigantic, ridiculous oak tree. That's one tree. Okay? That tree came from one acorn. Just, just circle back to that for a second, okay? That tree is from one over underwhelming, tiny, obscure squirrel food creature thing sitting there, obscure and overlooked, hiding under a leaf. That came from that, okay? Who knew that that one acorn was going to still be there today? You know what I mean? How many thousands of trees has that tree started? How many hundreds of thousands of animals, birds, has that tree sustained? For thousand, for over, like, I believe that tree is like 800 to 1200 years old. That long, that tree has been fruitful. For that long, that tree has provided shelter, sustenance, substance to so much of the social, physical, natural ecosystems that it's been in. It, it, like, there's a reason people still drive there to this day. They travel all from all over the place to get their picture in front of that tree, to go stand under the shade of that tree. It said when Abraham was sojourning and being a pilgrim, right, migrant worker style, traveling around the world, it said he like pitched his tents under the oaks of Mamre. And I'm like, what, is, what do you think those oaks looked like? that you know mm -hmm. i'm like you betcha man people used to live in the trees like people used to live in these trees they were so massive so awesome so awe-inspiring that you're like i want to live here the rest of my life that's literally why we came to the east because i grew up in the deserts where like the biggest trees were underwhelming you're like they cleared off all the forest so long ago that i just was under inspired but then i started studying the oaks and i started studying why are the oaks different than the other ones because if you plant that acorn you're gonna be like yeah I planted an acorn. This is going to be terrific. And the next year it grows six inches. And you're like, what the heck? You're like, this is the most depressing. Like it's a very slow reward system. It's a slow circle of like grade. I've got five leaves and six inches of glory coming out of the ground right now. That little acorn, what happened under the ground there in that rhizome that we're talking about, that little like battle zone is it went down two feet. It took what well, that tap root, it took that thing and drove it straight down into the depths of what it needed more than anything ever, which was consistency of nutrients and water. It knew that at the end of the day, even if it was super well healthy and fed and all the nutrients were happening, if that thing didn't deeply plant its roots, it was going to die in the first big storm. That it was going to get blown over like the shallow rooted cedars, like the junipers around it. Like when we, we, I'm living in the Ozarks now. Like I love being all around the trees. We had a windstorm come through here. That was basically a tornado everywhere. And they call it like shearing winds. These winds come in at an absolute single direction to where all the grass, you walked out, I walked out in the morning and all the grass was blown over and broken in a single direction. It was crazy different than the normal storms I caught in Colorado. And all these tree branches are smashed and broken everywhere. Trees are falling over, uprooted. I'm looking at black walnuts that are completely on their side. 80, 100 year old black walnuts. Trees that have been here a long time, y'all, are gone. And you're like, what's the deal with the oaks? Because there's no branches down of the oak trees. Like there's some little shrubs and stuff. Then no, I drove in through, I was driving through the neighborhood nearby. And I saw that some were broken in half at the tops, like broken in half, but none of them were uprooted. None of them were uprooted because they invested so much of their resources into the foundations. They put so much time and energy into deepening their roots so that when the inevitable winds came, when the inevitable storms of trials and testings, pestilence, when the inevitable onslaught of the overarching wicked destruction came against them, they were unmoved. They were unmoved. The reason that oak tree is still there and all the other trees died is because it had its roots deep. Like you're looking at it when you look at trees, y'all, you're looking at basically a tiny mirror image of what is going on underneath the surface. Like if you map out a tree's root system, which is an incredible and wonderful endeavor to do, you will find out so quickly how these roots are, are literally what holds the tree upright. It's provide and sustains it in a counterbalance. Like when you see a big limb reaching to the right in a tree underneath the ground, there's an even bigger root system that's counterbalancing that. And so when that root gets taken out, 
down, it lifts itself and holds itself. And then that branch system dies off. Like the, the wonderful lessons that are hiding in these trees and these plants all around us can take your eyes off of the evil machinations of men. They can so quickly give you the reminder that, you know what, all of his creation is crying out day and night testifying to the wonders of their creator so that no man is without excuse. Like none of us are without excuse. The truth is always going to protect perpetually be protected in the creation all around us. Like you can go and study like this book, dirt to soil. One of my favorites by Gabe Brown. He's got this little section in here on the rhizome. And like, I read this and it's like a, it's like a testimony of the creator's intimacy and love. Like in this tiny little dirt packet that everyone's like, whatever, it's just dirt. I'm like, you can learn the secrets of creation in that yes thank you for putting a picture up that's awesome you see that beautiful thing that's happening right there y'all this isn't as this is a subtropical climate you see those are banana trees behind it okay those are super shallow rooting system they're basically grass that banana behind there bananas are one of only three things on the earth that put out roots fruit and Leaves all at the same time. Papayas, bananas, and uh, what's the last one? Pineapple. They're the only three foods on the earth that do that. Though That thing will get blown over in a storm so fast it'll make your head spin. Like you can pee on that thing too hard and those banana trees are coming down, right? <laughs> but do you see that? Look at that. Just That is just such an awesome picture. Those roots, leave it up, dude. I got to see that thing. Hey, I could preach all day from this thing. Okay, that is, that, that is just a textbook cutaway. So you see what this tree has done over its lifetime. The, it is tapped into, there's, there's good soil there at the top. That's like the active soil layer that you see a little bit of blackness there at, the, at that, that very beginning level. But you see that roots have tapped down through the rock. It has literally gone down into the rocky substrate, right? In this layer of soil that normally you'd be like, that's just dirt. There's no nutrients down there. There is more nutrients in a single foot of dirt than you can ever get in a bag of fertilizer y'all you just need the right rhizome you need the right creatures down there working to get it out of there and that tree is still alive even though the entire other half of it is gone even though all that soil is ripped away and now that tree will still outlive all those other plants around it because those roots are the anchor and if we will anchor ourselves just like those trees if we will deeply anchor ourselves like tyler if you will deeply anchor yourselves in this word and in the foundations of his creation he will clothe you with wisdom to make wise choices so that you can indeed over overcome the strategy of the enemy, but don't, don't spend so much time. I just encourage you, brother, spend a little less time looking at the schemes of the devil. You know what I mean? Cause there you've got a good grasp on it. You've got a great handle on it and you can articulate it exquisitely. You have a talent and a gifting to bring this information to people and you can continue to show them how to get out of this system. And you are driving it home, brother. You really are. You are fiercely revealing what is the most critical component to these people, which is giving them the bread of life, which is giving them the sustenance that they need. And I agree with you. I have so much of a similar passion to see people invigorated with the skills that they've lost because you know the rewards that come when people get to be a part of what it is to make food come into their bodies. Like well, someone gave me this, they like brought me a little jar of goodies, right? This is called bitter root. This stuff, this stuff is literally like the cure to so many of the diseases that are out there. And most people are deadly uncomfortable eating it because as soon as you chew this stuff, I'm going to do it. It's really uncomfortable. Bitter in the mouth means happy liver. That's like the cure of it. Oh, it's just, it's like fighting into something. Oh, it's, <laughs> It's, it's unpalatable. That's oh the nicest God. way to put it. It's like licking the underside of someone's tire. It's so bad. It's so bad. It's deadly uncomfortable to eat that stuff. And everything, I don't want to eat it. <laughs> everything in me says don't right and if you give this to children you're like here here's this thing that'll make you so much happier and healthier and stronger you try to feed that to a child that's been brainwashed into thinking high fructose corn syrup is a food group and you're like trying that's the war i'm trying to wage i'm like how do i get people to want this this how do i get them to want this more than they want the candy I'm like, how do I do it? How do I do it? And I'm like, with persuasion and consistency, you've got to detoxify them. And this is why the, the this is why the microgreens, this is why the water, this is why the food is so critical. Because if you can detoxify them, those parasites, this what's in their guts, all the all of the bad rhizome, right? All of the bad nutrients that have been in there poisoning them will die off. And their appetites will change. They will literally desire it to where I am sitting here, I'm 34 years old. And I'm voluntarily choosing to eat this. So I just swallowed it. 
it's so bad. I want this in my body because I understand the benefits towards my liver and towards my guts is so outweighing my medium level of discomfort right now. What is he's showing you right there is the most critical component to your mind, which is your guts. You cannot think, you cannot fight, you cannot overcome this without giving those bacteria, those incredible little muscle systems and organ systems in your body the nutrients they need to overcome. Dude, I can't believe you just ate bitter root on camera. It's decadent. It's delicious. It's utterly detestable in my mouth, but it's good for me and I need it. Do the difficult things right away. Do the difficult things. Well, I think we uh I think we might hit a stopping point here. Let's um, go for it. I did I did want to end on something, and this is really interesting to me. <clears throat> this is hard to grasp if you well, I'm just going to get right into it. You in your book so far, there is this um, disassociation that happens. There is a um, reference to when you are speaking about yourself in certain contexts of storytelling or recalling memories where you use um, the word we instead of mm -hmm. I or, you know, this is what happened to me. It's a we. And um Basically, Nathan, I just want to tell you that I know certain people have certain gifts. I know, I know that certain people are trusted more than others, like with, with the kingdom parable of uh, the people that were supposed to take care of the estate. And one of them took the 10 bags of silver that his master had entrusted him with and he went out and used his gifts basically and um, multiplied it. He was given, or they were each given um, one bag. Then the first servant went out and brought him 10 bags. So he, he did well with what he was given. And the second one did five. And the servant said, good job, you know, with what you've been given. And then the last servant was like, oh man, like the servant, he's, you know, planting crops that aren't his. And like, he, you know, I'm scared because what if I don't reciprocate this investment? What if I lose his money? And like, he had a spirit of fear about it. Yeah. And he ended up burying it because he said to himself, basically, you know, at least I won't lose what he gave me. And then, you know, all three of them turn their, their uh, work in and the first servant, he goes, wow, you are a good servant. You know, you've taken what I've given you and you've multiplied it 10 times. And he said the same thing. He said, good job to the second servant who took what he was given and made five times out of it. And then he rebuked the third servant and said, you know, the least you could have done is take this and go put it in the bank and it could have got some interest and basically rebuked him because he didn't do well with what he was given. And I just, I know that certain people have stronger gifts than others. And I know that, you know, everybody has the capability and the potentiality to be great and to grow and to be even more increased with what they are given. If they show that they're responsible with the things that they've already been given. So with that being said, I know that you have a gift of communication. I know that you have a gift of being able to articulate what it is that you're thinking or what it is that you're seeing or perceiving. And I know that you have a gift to learn things quickly. I know that you have a gift to be able to um, identify and discern your environment in multi different levels. Um, I know this because of the rhetoric that you write your book with. And in order to have that type of understanding and merging dimensions of philosophical understanding, um, memory recall, and the knowledge and wisdom to tie it in into a relevant way 
I don't know what those gifts looked like before you met Yeshua, but I know now that you have met Yeshua and you're using them for the kingdom, they're undeniably amazing. And I've met a few people in my life that have similar gifts to me. And we discussed some of this on the phone call, but just for the viewers, like, there, if you have a gift and if you're good at something, do whatever you can to use that for good mm -hmm. and figure out and really spend some good time understanding what that good is. And when you do that, I don't care what gift you have, you're going to be trusted with more. You're going to be given more. You're going to explore that gift more intimately. You're going to be able to use that gift in ways that you never thought possible. You're going to surprise yourself about what it is that you were just a part of, let alone that you facilitated. And Nathan, I just think it's so wonderful. I think it's so cool about the life that you've lived, your testimony, your ability to communicate. And I just feel so uh, connected to you. And I feel so personally affiliated with you because I I have yet to find someone who is able to kind of wheel and deal or to kind of just play around or to work in the same faculties as I have. And mm -hmm. it's encouraging to me because a lot of times um, the feeling will be kind of like well, I'm different. Like I'm super different. I'm so different that it's hard to relate period. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's sometimes what I've had to um, just kind of rest in or just accept the fact that it is what it is. So to meet you and to understand that there is someone out there that has these gifts and has these abilities and is using it towards the kingdom is such a total faith booster for me specifically, personally, and I'm sure thousands of people feel the same way watching this right now. And let it be an inspiration for all of us to whatever it is that we're good at, whatever it is that we can do. Or even if you're watching this thinking, I don't know what I'm good at. Good at. Here's this Nathan guy and here's this Tyler guy and they know and you know they're good at it, blah, 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 blah. Like, what am I good at? When you read the word of truth, you will discover what it is that you're good at and you will discover how to use it. And when you do, you will feel a feeling of fulfillment that you have never even conceived of or fathomed in your life. And it will bring such a joy and such a ripe fruit juice spilling into your very soul. It's going to just reinvigorate everything that you thought you knew about life. So I... I encourage you to chase that down and to figure that out. And it, it's only going to come through scripture. You're only going to have these revelations revealed to you as you submit yourself to the father. And as you um, show him that you have the capability to use your free will to be obedient to him. And once that discernment, that connection is made, your life is going to explode in ways that don't even make sense to you really. So thank you, Nathan, for just being you and being able to hold on and to survive and to take all of we that is you and discipline them into a genuine, true, no red flags, power source for the kingdom of light. And hallelujah, brother. Thank you for coming on here and thank you for sharing your story and thank you for being who you are. And I cannot wait brother, to do more podcasts and to share some life with you and your family and to just strengthen and teach people and use our gifts together to just fight the fight, man. Yeah. It's worth it. You know, I held on for a long time, hoping I never lost hope. That's what made me different. I was hopeless, but I was never without hope. Because some of us are destined to overcome. It's an inevitability. They're called survivors for a reason. 
They're called the remnant for a reason because they're the leftovers. The, everybody else died, but there was one soul remaining over and over and over and over and over again. Like I saw so much death. I saw so much sorrow and heartache and failure. And I just, I knew, I knew that there was going to come a time where people didn't look away, where people cared enough to stop it, where people cared enough to not turn another blind eye. And then it would be time. It would be time for those survivors to rise up because there's a reason they split and they shatter these people because they look for people of talented intellect. They, you can't take somebody who's got an, uh, a hundred IQ and split them into 10 parts. You end up with blubbering messes. And this is why they seek out people of brilliance. They seek out people that have aptitudes and gifts and talents that are, that are, that are not normal. And it's, it's shattering it's utterly shattering that they then look at that person as some kind of mirror, some kind of piece of glass that they can take pieces and portions off of and use them for this and use them for that. And you know what? But that's why I was so devoted to seeing those two little girls that you saw. Like those girls, I just, I wanted to see what they could be without all of the baggage I have. You know, I, I wanted to see them be their full potential. I wanted them to be free. Like truly free, like that Naomi man, she's a warrior, bro. She's a warrior. And she's so gentle. Like she's a mom. She's like, she wants to be a mom. She raises my seven-year-old twins in ways that I can't. I can't even be around them crying and screaming. Like I I have so many other weaknesses and vulnerabilities that are still there. They're like, they're unstoppable at times. But I see this child, my daughter, she's she doesn't have that weakness. She's not terrorized at the sound of a child crying. She doesn't have any of the baggage there. And so she's able to step into an arena that I can't fight in. I can't, I can't go into that room when there's that kind of chaos, but she can. Like she can and she does. Like she has seen miracles. She has seen bravery and boldness. <sighs> she's made for battle. And then that little girl, Jubilee, who's sleeping in my arms, she's like, she's so delicate. She's so tender. She's a shofar. She's a jubilee. Every seven years, they're supposed to have this Sabbath year of rest where you're supposed to have a year off. And like my wife and I have been together seven years when we had her and like it was the freedom. We sold our house. We got on the road. It was like we were free. And she was my giant freedom, that blowing of the shofar that brought the walls of Jericho down, man. She was my freedom. And then like we lost two babies on the road. You know, I buried two of my children on the road. And it was horrible. It was the worst thing that's happened it was to lose two. And it was, it was devastating. And so many people are losing their babies. Like you're like, why are there so many miscarriages? Why are so many people losing their children? And so broken. But you know what? The father redeemed it. And he gave us life out of that death. And he gave my wife twins in her womb. And we didn't even know it. And it was this like veiled miracle that was waiting. Like I didn't know it till I caught my son after I caught my daughter, like three nights of labor in this Airbnb in Van Buren, Missouri. Like my wife gave birth to miracles and like he has raised up life for me in the most unexpected places. He's raised up life for me in so many ways because I am, I am living for the lives of thousands. Like I look, I can still see, I have been cursed with memory, you know? Like I, it doesn't go away. I have this, this memory bank. It's a vault that is just un, inexhaustible. I have a data storage drive that never gets full, you know, and it's just, it's instantly there, all of it continually. And it can flood you and overwhelm you and crush you. But you know what? I never lose their names. I never lose their faces because I'm living for them. Like the reason I'm a we is because I'm living for them. Like I'm living for Ashley. Like I'm living for Alexander. I'm living for these people that I loved who, who lost. I'm living for them. And you know what? There's so many of you who are living for people that they need you. They need you to not forget them. You guys are the reason that we're here. You survivors, you people that think that you are the waste basket of society are the most precious resource, the most precious treasure. Yahuwah calls you his segula, his precious treasure. Like that's why over here on this wall, 
You guys, I just got gemstones and treasures that I have found and scoured. This is how I stored my memories. Like, I stored my memories in these rocks. Like this piece right here. This little, this is piece of petrified wood that I found when I was nine years old in, in Arizona. Sorry, I'm all over the place here. Hold on, let me grab that. Anyways, this little rock right here is a literal memory bank for me. I can remember the exact place I was and everything that was surrounding the events that took place instantly when I hold it. Because as much as they stripped my memory and took it all away from me, I could pick up a rock and I could remember everything. And I was like, do you know what? We're supposed to be these living stones. You're supposed to be a living stone of witness. You're supposed to be a testimony. And it says the enemy, the dragon, the devil of old, that serpent, is defeated by the blood of the lamb, the words of our testimony, and not loving our lives when faced with death. You know what? Every one of us is going to be faced with death. But if we share our testimonies, we can be the overcomers by that. We can be setting other captives free. The father has built into his system the entire network of their destruction. He says that they dig a pit. They're going to fall into it. You think the surveillance state that they have built up is for you? It's for your adversaries, y'all. The good news is everything they intend for evil. The Father intends for good and the saving of many lives. Thank you for having me on here today. It's been an absolute joy to be with you. And I pray and I eagerly seek all those other incredibly talented and gifted people to rise up from those unbelievable places of pain and suffering and monotony that you've been in. Because though the days may be evil, you were born for such a time as this. Amen. Keep on keeping on. Holy. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for this transmission. I thank you for all of the things that have been scattered as seeds in the people's hearts. And I just pray that you would go out into every single person that listens to this, that is listening right now and will continue to listen. And I pray that you do a mighty work in their lives, Lord and that the floodgates of blessing and the floodgates of truth would just overwhelm people. And Lord, that you'd begin to do a mighty work in this earth and start to heal the land, Father God, and just prepare the way and help the remnant to keep on waking up and to keep on growing mighty and to keep on just doing what it is that we are all supposed to do so that at the end of the day, when it's all said and done, we can be celebrating with you in New Jerusalem. Thank you so much for Nathan. I pray a hedge of protection over his family and himself and his and devours. And I also pray that same hedge of protection over me and my family and my friends and everything that I've got going on here. And for everybody else that's watching, Lord, just I just pray and plead your blood, Lord. King Yeshua Messiah, just cover us all, your children. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus, in your precious name. You pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Okay. I'm going to end the recording. I think we will still be able to hear each other.